the streets, roads and dusty lanes of Colombia have been fertile territory for myths and legends since long before the arrival of the Spaniards. Tales of La Patasola, a one-legged wailing banshee that forever sought her child, and of El Duende, a backwards fretted goblin that led travelers to their doom, nibbled at the corners of journeyman's ease for centuries. Although these stories mainly trouble those living in or passing through rural areas, the growth of cities brought with it a new breed of urban legend, rooted in the primal distrust of modern technology that we still harbor somewhere deep inside. An example of this is the phantom bus that allegedly roams the city streets at night. Supposedly, the young women who poured it alone are found mutilated and overgrown outlying fields a few days later with the frozen look of abject terror illustrating the moment of their last tormented breath. That being said, given that you're certainly not a young woman, and that is 5.30 on a Tuesday afternoon, phantom buses and handicapped gremlins are the last thing on your mind. You've been using Bogota's public transportation system for over a decade, and your greatest concern is that the traffic levels have become all but unmanageable since the latest mayor took office. However, home is about 80 blocks away, so your only choice is to wait until the right bus comes along. Walking would certainly take longer than putting up with any traffic jam. When the bus displaying the route sign you're hoping for shows up, its advertised fare is 200 pesos lower than the standard going rate these days. This usually indicates that the vehicle in question is older and a bit more uncomfortable than most, but no bus rider in the history of the city has ever given a damn about that. Folks that consider themselves richer and above this mode of transportation pay seven times as much to get around by cab, and statistically expose themselves to a higher chance of being mocked or robbed. More power to them, right? Never want to avoid seeking further discounts, you ask the wizened driver if he'll let you on for a thousand. The wrinkled, musty-looking man's eyes never leave the road, as he silently takes your bill and slides it in the purse hanging from the pony gear stick. Satisfied, you turn your attention to the cabin. What would make this ride ideal would be an empty seat. Curiously enough, considering the time of day, there aren't enough passenger support for anybody to be standing. A few available spots are in sight, so you choose one on the left towards the middle. Both the L and window seat are free and you sigh contentedly as you sprawl out on one with your knee nested on the other. This particular trip should be over in no time. The driver's radio is off, and your phone's battery ran out an hour ago, so you pass the time by staring out the window and watching vendors ply their wares and car drivers not along to whatever music they're enjoying. Your position eventually starts taking a toll on your back, so you straighten up and take the chance to examine your fellow passengers. None of them seem to be riding together, given that everybody is quietly facing the front of the bus. They are also all uncommonly old, not in the sense that they're all over a hundred, but in the sense that nobody seems to be under seventy-five. You find this a bit odd, and for a brief moment, the idea that you don't belong there flashes through your mind. It's a silly thought, but combined with the bus is particularly strong, although not necessarily a typical smell of must and metal makes you look forward to the end of the trip. Nevertheless, as there are another 30 or 40 blocks to go, you look out the window again, zone out, and let your mind wander for a while. The sight of Pacho's bakery pulls you out of your reverie 20 minutes later. You get up and make your way past your silent companions to the rear exit where you hunt for the little silver button that will let the driver know that you've reached your stop. As you spot it above the door, you realize that nobody's boarded or left the vehicle since you got on, which is particularly weird for rushing.
rush hour. Shrugging it off as a weird coincidence, you press down on the button and grab onto the... You are sitting on your seat, facing the front of the bus. What? What the hell just happened? You look around and see that everybody is still where they were a moment ago. Trying to make eye contact with them is fruitless, since they all seem to be lost wherever it is that all minds wander. The thought of saying something runs through your head, but you decide against it. What would you say anyway? You are probably so zoned out that you simply imagined getting up the ring to drive a spell. That's probably it. Daydreams are occasionally so vivid that leaving them is downright startling. Besides, you're already two blocks past your stop. Just call it a weird thing that happened on your way home, or whatever, but for now, you should just get off the bus. There's no point in having to walk back too far. You, once again, get off your seat and head for the rear exit, somewhat unnerved by the other passengers' stoic disinterest in everything around them. There's the button, right where you remember it, except that you can't remember it, of course since you've never actually been back here yet. You probably just saw it when you got on. After grabbing onto the guardrail, since these bastards occasionally decide to stop on a time when you ring, you look towards the driver, put your thumb on the button. You are sitting on your seat, facing the front of the bus. A piercing chill runs down your spine, and instead of fading away, it spreads through every one of your extremities. It's not a shift in body or ambient temperature, it's the chill you feel when suddenly consumed by the level of fear that slightly precedes terror. Something really messed up is going on here. You don't know what it is, but you want out. You don't want to be here anymore. A feeling of bitter solitude is now gnawing at your mind. Whatever these people around you are thinking, they clearly don't give a damn about what's going on with you. Therefore, you once again decide to avoid saying anything and simply lift yourself off the seat, not processing the fact that you did it with less agility than should have been the case. All you want right now is to get off the bus. Besides, it's already advanced more than 10 blocks past your street, which suddenly feels like a distastefully long distance to walk. This is all secondary to the point at hand, however. You have to get off this damn thing. As you make your way back, an old lady in the back row looks up at you. Her expression tells you nothing, but the weight fixes on you, on your torso to be precise, as if you were just another chunk of the vehicle, further spikes the almost overpowering sense of dread now coursing through your veins. Whatever, you can panic. Not now. You stand at the back of the bus, and instead of going for the button, you yell at the driver. You yell at him to stop, to let you off, that you've already rung twice, but nothing comes of it. You curse at him, tell him what disease he will die of, and wish great evil upon his skin. But the door remains unmoved. The man is not listening, or he doesn't care or he doesn't want you to get off. But you don't give a damn what he wants or doesn't want, so you grab onto the bars, take a step back for momentum, and send a solid kick right into the collar of the door in just that. You are sitting on your seat, facing the front of the bus. It takes a moment to register, maybe more than a moment, maybe it's a full minute, as you realize that the bus doesn't want you to leave, you also realize that your right knee hurts with an unnatural, piercing sharpness. It's the same leg you used against the door, and now it feels like it's all but broken. This quickly becomes a distant concern when you attempt to massage it though, because that's when you notice your hands. These are not the hands of a 25-year-old. They are wrinkly, set with well-defined veins, even lightly patched with liver spots. As you study your hands and arms, cold terror envelops every corner of your psyche. 
you touch your face and feel wrinkles and whiskers that didn't previously exist upon your cheekbones. Your head is patched with a few anemic strands of hair. As your fingertip grazes your coarse scalp, a spark of electricity shoots through it and down into the most private recesses of your being. Your eyes dry up, open wide and unbelieving, and you feel a seven-ton lump of horror coalesce in your otherwise paralyzed throat. You must leave this evil boss. You must leave it at once before it finishes what it's begun. You carefully make your way off your seat. No need for any further injury. And head towards the front, towards the driver. Perhaps you can reason with him. Or perhaps you can club him to death with a flashlight or something. Since there are always a variety of trinkets and gadgets at the front of the... You are sitting on your seat facing the front of the bus. It takes a good five or ten minutes for you to come to terms with what is happening to you, to understand that your life is vanishing before your eyes. Your hands are now like those of your great-grandmother. Your back hurts from its base all the way up to your neck, and your eyes can barely focus on the huge signs posted above the windows. Even your mind isn't as sharp as it should be. It takes you a while to determine that you should make another attempt at the exit. Perhaps violence is not the answer. Perhaps you can gently pull it open. Perhaps if you treat the bus like a living, gentle being instead of like a demonic machine, it will let you out perhaps. The old woman is looking at you again. You notice her blue jacket, which is much too big for her. If it were a blouse of the same size, hang loosely off her gaunt frame. A tiny, hesitant tear forms on her frail face, and then follows a meandering path down her ancient features to land on her wrist with an eerie finality. There's a red total watch around that wrist, the sort that is currently out of rage with kids graduating from high school. You examine the door, two panes joined by a vertical line of hinges, coated on the right by a rubber pad to avoid contact damage. The door is slightly bent inwards, and as you notice this, a glimmer of hope runs through you. If you can just insert, you are sitting on your seat, facing the front of the bus. What the hell? What the hell is going on? My hands, they are old. My hands look like the hands of a dying old man. The driver stares at you in the rearview mirror, so you slowly walk up to him. You yell at him and grab his face, screaming at him insistently to let you off. You mouth something you don't understand. His teeth, full of blood, your teeth, the cracking. Oh my god, my teeth are crumbling to dust. What the hell? How long have I been here? Screw this. I'm breaking the window with my elbow even if it breaks. I don't want to die here in this fu- You are sitting on your seat, facing the front of the bus. After a long time, you glance down at your hands. They are the gnarled, rheumatic, blood spatter claws of a hag that's seen more than one generation's share of horrors. A hag. A hag is not the right word. A hag is a woman. Right? At least so it was in your mother's stories, like those of La Patasola or El Duende. Your knee still hurts, but not as much as your elbow. It feels like it is shattered. Ah yes, this bus. You must get off it. You know you must get off it now. You do not remember why you must, but it is imperative that you do. It is urgent. It was urgent. You are so tired. You try to lift yourself off the seat, but your knee buckles under your weight. It is by chance that you fall back on the bench. You must get off the bus. Remember these buses. They used to take you to work. You steady yourself on the bench. You'll try to get off the bus. But in a moment, 
must rest. The bus can wait. You are sitting on your seat, facing the front of the bus. You are sitting on your seat, facing the front of the bus. You are sitting on your seat, facing the front of the bus. always been kind of overexcited, running up and down the corridor, jumping all over our guests, relentlessly barking and so on. I'm aware it's probably my fault for encouraging this type of behavior and not being strict enough when he was a puppy. However, over the past few days, he has been very quiet, a bit too quiet. He's always hiding under the bed or behind the curtains, and sometimes he even tries to hide under our linens, which is very unusual since he's never allowed on the bed. Up until today, I just shrugged it off. It was peaceful not having him running about all the time. But right now, he won't come out from under an old pallet stacked with boxes in the basement. It's been a couple of hours already, and all I've managed to get out of him is this strange, unnatural growl whenever I try to get close. Maybe he ate something that didn't sit well with his stomach. All I know is, it doesn't sound like him at all. I flipped the light switch on, but the light bulb just blew, causing the crawling to start up again. He sounds so angry, and I'm worried that he might be seriously hurt, so I decide to lay flat on my stomach and reach out to him in the pitch black darkness, hoping to grab his collar. As 
As my eyes slowly adjust to the darkness, I feel his warm breath on my hand, joined by the slight yet eerie vibration of his guttural growl. He's never bitten me before, but I just can't shake off this sense of dread. As I move my hand in closer, suddenly I hear a dog yelping from the opposite side of the basement, and I instinctively turn my head around, only to notice my dog curled up in the corner, staring at the creature burying its sharp teeth from underneath the boxes. now. It's 5.45 a.m. and there's not much I can do. You know what the worst part of my situation is? I'm in the same room with my parents. They keep looking at me and I can't help but look back and try not to cry or scream. Their eyes are focused on me and their mouths are wide open. There's a strong scent of blood and I feel paralyzed with fear. Here's the thing. The second I make any hint that I'm not asleep anymore, I'm completely screwed. I will die and there's nobody around to save me. I've been trying to think of a way out, but the only idea I have is to rush for the door, run outside and scream for help, hoping that my neighbors can hear me. It's risky, but if I stay here, I'll surely die. He's waiting for me to wake up and see his masterpiece. You're probably wondering what's going on. I do get ahead of myself sometimes. About three hours ago, I heard screaming from the other side of the house. I got out and went to check on the noise before realizing that I had to use the restroom. Instead of doing the smart thing and investigating, I used the bathroom first. I could have gotten killed right then for my stupid actions but actually did my business and took a peek outside the bathroom. There was blood on the carpet. I panicked and ran back to my room, hiding under my sheets like the coward I was. I tried to convince myself to go back to sleep. There was just some really vivid dream or something. But then I heard my bedroom door open. Like the terrified child I was, I peeked from under my blankets to see what was going on. I could see something dragging my dead parents into the room. It was not human, I can tell you that. It was hairless, with no eyes and no clothing. It walked like a caveman, with its back slouched as it dragged my parents. But this thing was much smarter than any caveman was aware of what he was doing. It propped my dad up on the edge of my bed and made him face me. It then sat my mother down in the chair and positioned her towards me as well. It then started rubbing its hands upon the walls, staining them with blood and then drew a circle with the devil's pentagram in it. <laughs> this thing has made what it would probably call a masterpiece. To finish it off, it scribbled a message onto the wall I could not read in the darkness. It then positioned itself under my bed, waiting to strike. The scariest thing is that now my eyes have adjusted to the darkness, and I can read the message on the wall. I don't want to look at it because it's terrifying to think about, but I feel that I need to see it before I make a run for it, before I get killed. I take a peek at the creature's masterpiece and the text under it. I know you're awake. A beautiful young girl is left home alone with only her dog to protect her. On the news that night, they announced that there is a serial killer on the loose in the area. Before she goes to bed, she locks all the doors and also tries to lock all the windows. But the one in the basement won't lock, so she decides to leave it unlocked 
that locks the basement door and goes to bed. The dog takes its customary place under her bed. In the deep of the night, she awakens to a dripping sound coming from her bathroom. Half awake, the girl feels the comforting lick from her dog and falls back to sleep. She reawakens to the dripping sound, reaches her hand down to the dog where she feels the reassuring lick and falls back to sleep. Once more, she awakens to the dripping sound. She reaches her hand down, feels the lick of her dog. Now fully awake and curious about the dripping sound, she gets up and slowly walks towards the bathroom, the dripping sound getting louder as she approaches. She opens the bathroom's door and turns on the light. She is greeted by a horrific sight. A dog is hanging from the shower nozzle with its throat slit open and blood dripping into the bathtub. Something on the bathroom mirror catches her eye. She turns around and written on the wall in her dog's blood are the words Humans can lick too. a hunter in the woods. After a long day hunting, he was in the middle of an immense forest. It was getting dark and having lost his bearings, he decided to head in one direction until he was clear of the increasingly oppressive foliage. After what seemed like hours, he came across a cabin in a small clearing. Realizing how dark it had grown, he decided to see if he could stay there for the night. He approached and found the door ajar. Nobody was inside. The hunter flopped down on the single bed, deciding to explain himself to the owner in the morning. As he looked around the inside of the cabin, he was surprised to see the walls adorned by several portraits, all painted in incredible detail. Without exception, they appeared to be staring down at him, their features twisted into looks of hatred and malice. Staring back, he grew increasingly uncomfortable, making a concerted effort to ignore the many hateful faces. He turned to face the wall, and exhausted, fell into a restless sleep. The next morning, the hunter awoke. He turned blinking in unexpected sunlight. Looking up, he discovered that the cabin had no portraits, only windows. Just look down at my 
my strange deformities. I shoved my left hand in first. The immediate sensation of sharp blades slicing through flesh was jarring, but I was surprised at how well the alcohol was working. I expected it to hurt more. I could hear the sharp metal churning and cutting, working perfectly as planned. I pressed my hand down harder. All those bad memories, all of the embarrassment, all of those horrible things were now nothing more than a thick red pop. Breaking from the feeling of ecstasy, I pulled out before the blades hit knuckle. I smiled, taking a good look at my new hand. As for the growths, well, five down and five more to go.
He stared blankly at the ceiling as teardrops silently streaked across his face. For two weeks, the subject had to be manually rehydrated due to the constant crying. Eventually, he turned his head and, despite his blindness, made focused eye contact with the scientist for the first time in the study. He whispered, I have spoken with God, and he has abandoned us. As his vital signs stopped, there was no apparent cause of death. During the summer of 2003, events in the northeastern United States involving a strange human-like creature sparked brief local media interest before an apparent blackout was enacted. Little or no information was left intact as most online and written accounts of the creature were mysteriously destroyed. Primarily focused in rural New York State and once found in Idaho, self-proclaimed witnesses told stories of their encounters with a creature of unknown origin. Emotions ranged from extremely traumatic levels of fright and discomfort to an almost childlike sense of playfulness and curiosity. While their published versions are no longer on record, the memories remain powerful. Several of the involved parties began looking for answers that year. In early 2006, the collaboration had accumulated nearly 2,000 documents dating between the 12th century and the present day, spanning four continents. In almost all cases, the stories were identical. I've been in contact with a member of this group and was able to get some excerpts from their upcoming book. A Suicide Note, 1964 As I prepare to take my life, I feel it necessary to assuage any guilt or pain I have introduced through this act. It is not the fault of anyone other than him. For once I awoke and felt his presence. And once I awoke and saw his form. Once again I awoke and heard his voice and looked into his eyes. I cannot sleep without the fear of what I might next awake to experience. I cannot ever awake. Goodbye. Found in the same wooden box were two empty envelopes addressed to William and Rose, and one loose personal letter with no envelope. Dearest Linny, I have prayed for you. He spoke your name. A journal entry, translated from Spanish, 1880. I have experienced the greatest terror. I have experienced the greatest terror. I have experienced the greatest terror. I see his eyes when I close mine. They are hollow, black. They saw me and pierced me. His wet hand, I will not sleep. His voice. Unintelligible text fills the rest of the page. A Mariner's Log, 1691. He came to me in my sleep. From the foot of my bed, I felt a sensation. He took everything. We must return to England. We shall not return here again at the request of the rake. From a witness, 2006. Three years ago, my family and I had just returned from a trip to Niagara Falls on the 4th of July. We were all exhausted after a long day of driving. So my husband and I put the kids right to bed and called it a night. At about 4 a.m. I woke up thinking my husband had gotten up to use the restroom. I used the moment to steal back the sheets, only to wake him in the process. I apologized and told him I thought he got out of bed. When he turned to face me, he gasped and pulled his feet up from the end of the bed so quickly that his knee almost knocked me out of bed. He then grabbed me and said nothing. After adjusting to the dark for a half second, 
I was able to see what caused the strange reaction. At the foot of the bed, sitting and facing away from us, there was what appeared to be a naked man or a large hairless dog of some sort. Its body position was disturbing and unnatural, as if it had been hit by a car or something. For some reason, I was not instantly frightened by it, but more concerned as to its condition. At this point, I was somewhat under the assumption that we were supposed to help him. My husband was peering over his arm and knee, tucked into the fetal position, occasionally glancing at me before returning to the creature. In a flurry of motion, the creature scrambled around the side of the bed and then crawled quickly in a flailing sort of motion right along the bed until it was less than a foot from my husband's face. The creature was completely silent for about 30 seconds, or probably closer to 5. It just seemed like a while, just looking at my husband. The creature then placed its hand on his knee and ran into the hallway leading to the kids' rooms. I screamed and ran for the light switch, planning to stop him before he hurt my children. When I got to the hallway, the light from the bedroom was enough to see it crouching and hunched over about 20 feet away. He turned around and looked directly at me, covered in blood. I flipped the switch on the wall and saw my daughter Clara. The creature ran down the stairs while my husband and I rushed to help our daughter. She was very badly injured and spoke only once more in her short life. She said, he is the rake. My husband drove his car into a lake that night while rushing our daughter to the hospital. They did not survive. Being a small town, news got around pretty quickly. The police were helpful at first and the local newspaper took a lot of interest as well. However, the story was never published and the local television news never followed up either. For several months, my son Justin and I stayed in a hotel near my parents' house. After we decided to return home, I began looking for answers myself. I eventually located a man in the next town over who had a similar story. We got in contact and began talking about our experiences. He knew of two other people in New York who had seen the creature we now refer to as the Rake. It took the four of us about two solid years of hunting on the internet and writing letters to come up with a small collection of what we believed to be accounts of the rake. None of them gave any details, history or follow-up. One journal had an entry involving the creature in its first three pages and never mentioned it again. A ship's log explained nothing of the encounter saying only that they were told to leave by the rake. That was the last entry in the log. There were, however, many instances where the creature's visit was one of a series of visits with the same person. Multiple people also mentioned being spoken to, my daughter included. This led us to wonder if the rake had visited any of us before our last encounter. I set up a digital recorder near my bed and left it running all night, every night for two weeks. I would tediously scan through the sounds of me rolling around in my bed each day when I woke up. By the end of the second week, I was quite used to the occasional sound of sleep while blurring through the recording at eight times the normal speed. This still took almost an hour every day. On the first day of the third week, I thought I heard something different. What I found was a shrill voice. It was the rake. I can't listen to it long enough to even begin to transcribe it. I haven't let anyone listen to it yet. All I know is that I've heard it before. And I now believe that it spoke when it was sitting in front of my husband. I don't remember hearing anything at the time. But for some reason, the voice on the recorder immediately brings me back to that moment. The thoughts that must have gone through my daughter's head make me very upset. 
I have not seen the rake since he ruined my life, but I know he has been in my room while I slept. I know and fear that one night I'll wake up to see him staring at me again. There is a video on YouTube named Miriana Mortgard Gleskorov. If you search this, you will find nothing. The few times you find something, all you will see is a 20 second video of a man staring intently at you, expressionless, then grinning for the last two seconds. The background is undefined. This is only part of the actual video. The full video lasts two minutes was removed by YouTube after 153 people who viewed the video, gouged out their eyes and mailed them to YouTube's main office in San Bruno. Said people also committed suicide in various ways. 
how they managed to veil their eyes after gouging them out is not yet known. The cryptic inscription they carved on their forearms has not yet been deciphered either. YouTube would periodically put up the first 20 seconds of the video to cross suspicions so that people were not go look for the real thing and upload it again. The video itself was only viewed by one YouTube staff member who started screaming after 45 seconds. This man is now under constant sedation and is apparently unable to recall what he saw. The other people who were in the same room as him, while he viewed it and turned out the video for him, say that all they heard at the time was a high-pitched, drilling sound. None of them dared look at the screen. The person who uploaded the video was never found, the IP address being non-existent. And the man in the video has never been identified. I first met in person with Mary E. in the summer of 2007. I had arranged with her husband of 15 years, Terrence, to see her for an interview. Mary had initially agreed. I was not a newsman, but rather an amateur writer, gathering information for a few early college assignments, and, if all went according to plan, some pieces of fiction. We scheduled the interview for a particular weekend when I was in Chicago on unrelated business, but at the last moment Mary changed her mind and locked herself up in the couple's bedroom, refusing to meet with me. For half an hour I sat with as we camped outside the bedroom door, listening and taking notes while he attended fruitlessly to calm his wife down. The things Mary said made little sense, but fit with the pattern I was expecting. Though I could not see her, I could tell from her voice that she was crying, and more often than not, her objections to speaking with me centered around an incoherent diatribe on our dreams, our nightmares. Terence apologized profusely when we ceased the exercise, and I did my best to take it in stride. Recall that I wasn't a reporter in search of a story, but merely a curious young man in search of information. Besides, I thought at the time I could perhaps find another similar case if I put my mind and resources to it. Mary E. was the sysop for a small Chicago-based bulletin board system in 1992 she first encountered Smile.jpg, and her life changed forever. She and Terence had been married for only five months at the time. Mary was one of an estimated 400 people who saw the image when it was posted as a hyperlink on the PBS, though she is the only one who has spoken openly about the experience. The rest remain anonymous, or are perhaps dead. In 2005, when I was only in 10th grade, Smile.jpg or Smile.jpg was first brought to my attention by my burgeoning interest in web-based phenomena. Mary was the most often cited victim of what is sometimes referred to as Smile Talk or Smile.talk, the being that Smile.jpg is reputed to display. What caught my interest, other than the obvious macabre element, of the cyber legend and my proclivity towards such things was the sheer lack of information, usually to the point that people don't believe it even exists other than as a rumor or hoax. It is unique because although the entire phenomenon centers on a picture file, that file is nowhere to be found on the internet. Certainly many photo manipulated simulacra litter the web showing up with the most frequency on sites such as the image board 4 particularly the X-focused paranormal subword. It is suspected that these are fakes because they do not have the effect that true smile.jpg is believed to have, namely sudden onset temporal lobe epilepsy and acute anxiety. This purported reaction in the viewer is one of the reasons the phantom-like smile.jpg is regarded with such disdain, since it's patently absurd, though, depending on whom you ask, 
his reluctance to acknowledge smiled at JPEG's existence might be just as much out of fear as it is out of disbelief. Neither smile.jpg nor smile.doc is mentioned anywhere on Wikipedia, though the website features articles on such other, perhaps more scandalous shock sites as hello.jpg or two girls, one cup. Any attempt to create a page pertaining to smile.jpg is summarily deleted by any of the encyclopedia's many admins. Encounters with smile.jpg are the stuff of internet legends. Mary E's story is not unique. There are unverified rumors of smile.jpg showing up in the early days of Usenet, and even one persistent tale that in 2002 a hacker flooded the forums of humor and satire website, something awful, with a deluge of smile dog pictures, rendering almost half the forum's users at the time epileptic. It is also said that in the mid to late 90s that smile.jpg circulated on Usenet as an attachment of a chain email with the subject, smile, God loves you. Yet, despite the huge exposure these times would generate, there are very few people who admit to having experienced any of them, and no trace of the file or any link has ever been discovered. Those who claim to have seen smile.jpg often weakly joke that they were far too busy to save a copy of the picture to their hard drive. However, all alleged victims offer the same description of the photo. A dog-like creature, usually described as appearing similar to a Siberian husky, illuminated by the flash of the camera, sits in a dim lit room, the only visible background detail being a human hand extending from the darkness, near the left side of the frame. The hand is empty, but is usually described as beckoning. Of course, most attention is given to the dog, or dog creature, as some victims are more certain than others about what they claim to have seen. The muzzle of the beast is repeatedly split in a white grin, revealing two rows of very white, very straight, sharp, very human looking teeth. This is of course not a description given immediately after viewing the picture, but rather a recollection of the victims, who claim to have seen the picture endlessly repeated in their mind's eye, during the time they were in reality having epileptic fits. These seizures are reported to continue indefinitely, often while the victims sleep resulting in very vivid and disturbing nightmares. These may be treated with medication, though in some cases it is more effective than others. Mary E, I assumed, was not on efficient medication. That was why, after my visit to her apartment in 2007, I sent out feelers to several folklore and urban legend-oriented newsgroups, websites and mailing lists to find the name of a supposed victim of smile.jpg who felt more interested in talking about their experiences. For a time, nothing happened and at length I completely forgot about my pursuits since I had begun my freshman year of college and I was quite busy. Mary contacted me via email, however, near the beginning of March 2008. The email read as follows to jml at email.com from mary e at email.net subject last summer's interview dear mr l i am incredibly sorry about my behavior last summer when you came to interview me i hope you understand that it was no fault of yours but rather my own problems that led me to act out as i did i realized that i could have handled the situation more decorously However, I hope you'll forgive me. At the time, I was afraid. You see, for 15 years I have been haunted by a smile.jpg. Smile talk comes to me in my sleep every night. I know that sounds silly, but it is true. There is an ineffable quality about my dreams, my nightmares, that makes them completely unlike any real dreams I have ever had. I do not move and do not speak. I simply look ahead, and the only thing ahead of me is 
is the scene from that horrible picture. I see the beckoning hand, and I see Smile Dog. It talks to me. It is not a dog, of course, though I am not quite sure what it really is. It tells me it will leave me alone only if I do as it asks. All I must do, it says, is spread the word. That is how it phrases its demands, and I know exactly what it means. It wants me to show it to someone else. And I could. The week after my incident, I received in the mail a manila envelope with no return address. Inside was only a three and a half inch floppy diskette. Without having to check, I knew precisely what was on it. I thought for a long time about my options. I could show it to a stranger, a co-worker. I could even show it to Terence, as much as the idea disgusted me. And what would happen then? Well, if Smile Dog kept its word, I could sleep. Yet if it lied, what would I do? And who was to say something worse would not come for me if I did as the creature asked? So I did nothing for 15 years, although I kept the diskette hidden amongst my things. Every night for 15 years, Smile Dog has come to me in my sleep, and it demanded that I spread the word. For 15 years I have stood strong, though there have been hard times. Many of my fellow victims on the PPS board, where I first encountered Smile.jpg, stopped posting. I heard some of them committed suicide. Others remained completely silent, simply disappearing off the face of the web. They are the ones I worry about the most. I sincerely hope you will forgive me, Mr. L, but last summer when you contacted me and my husband about an interview, I was near the breaking point. I decided I was going to give you the floppy disk. I did not care if Smile Dog was lying or not, I just wanted it to end. A stranger, someone I had no connection with, and I thought I would not feel sorrow when you took the disc as part of your research and sealed your fate. Before you arrived, I realized what I was doing. I was plotting to ruin your life. I could not stand the thought, and in fact, I still cannot. I am ashamed, Mr. L, and I hope that this warning will dissuade you from further investigation of Smile.jpg. May in time encounter someone who is, if not weaker than I am, then wholly more depraved, someone who will not hesitate to follow Smile Dog's orders. Stop while you are still whole. Sincerely, Mary E. Terence contacted me later that month with the news that his wife had killed herself. While cleaning up the various things she'd left behind, closing email accounts and the like, he happened upon the above message. He was a man in shambles. He wept as he told me to listen to his wife's advice. He revealed that he had found the diskette and burned it until it was nothing but a stinking pile of black and plastic. The part that most disturbed him, however, was how the diskette had hissed as it melted. Like some sort of animal, he said. I will admit that I was a little uncertain about how to respond to this. At first, I thought perhaps it was a joke, with the couple belatedly playing with the situation in order to get a rise out of me. A quick check of several Chicago newspapers and online obituaries, however, proved that Mary E. was indeed dead. There was, of course, no mention of suicide in the article. I decided that, for a time at least, I would not further pursue the subject of Smile.jpg, especially since my finals were coming up at the end of May. But the world has odd ways of testing us. Almost a full year after I'd returned from my disastrous interview with Mary E., I received another email. It was short, yet full of spelling and punctuation errors. The email read as follows. JML at email.com from elzair82 at email.com Subject, smile. Hello, I found your email address through a mailing list. Your profile said you are interested in smiley talk. I have saw it. It's not as bad as everyone says. I have sent it to you here. Just spreading the word. Smiley face. 
final line chilled me to the bone. According to my email client, there was one file attachment called naturally smile.jpg. I considered downloading it for some time. It was most likely a fake, I imagined, and even if it weren't, I was never wholly convinced of smile.jpg's peculiar powers. Mary E's account had shaken me, yes, but she was probably mentally unbalanced anyway. After all, how could a simple image do what smile.jpg was said to accomplish? What sort of creature was it that could break one's mind with only the power of the eye? And if such things were patently absurd, then why did the legend exist at all? If I downloaded the image, if I looked at it, and if Mary turned out to be correct, if Smile Talk came to me in my dreams, demanding I spread the word, what would I do? Would I live my life as Mary had, fighting against the urge to give in until I died? Or would I simply spread the word, eager to be put to rest? And if I chose the latter route, how could I do it? Whom would I burden in turn? If I went through with my earlier intention to write a short article about smile.jpg, I decided I could attach it as evidence. And anyone who read the article, anyone who took interest, would be affected. And even assuming the smile.jpg attached to the email was genuine, would I be capricious enough to save myself in that manner? Could I spread the word? Yes. Yes, I could. In the 1940s, Russian researchers kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and 5 inch thick glass portal sized windows in the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cuts to sleep on but no bedding, running water and toilet, and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, and the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the fourth day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering to the microphones and one-way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber repeatedly, yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it, or rather didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until two more captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces, and pasted them calmly over the glass portals. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working, since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming out with five people inside. The 
oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, we are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice response. We no longer want to be freed. The debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging as if pleading for the lives of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers were set in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state of any of them as alive. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead death subjects' thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving death subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as the researchers initially thought. A closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. Abdominal organs below the rib cage of all four death subjects had been removed. While the heart, the lungs, and diaphragm remained in place, the skin and most of the muscle attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the rib cage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they will fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the dead subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out, and another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subjects' teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you count the ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had its spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him but this proved to be impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the human dose of a morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. When his heart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out to the point that there was more air in his vascular system than blood, even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flare for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach, 
just repeating the word more over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving free test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility, the two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas, demanding to be kept awake. The most injured one of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject for surgery, in order to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four inch wide leather strap on one wrist even though the weight of a 200-pound soldier was also holding the wrist down. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of the broken bones were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed, he was unable to beg or object to the surgery, as he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone reluctantly suggested that they try the surgery without anesthetic and did not react for the entire six hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should not be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of interesting importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well, although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own cuts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given, I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back into the chamber, awaiting the termination as to what should be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project, considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB agent, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious at this point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was training his legs against the leather bonds with all his might, first left, then right, then left again, for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. 
Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most researchers were monitoring his brain waves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on papers clawing out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brain waves immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brain waves showed the same fat lines as the one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject still restrained to a bed as the remaining medical and research team members fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things. Not with you, he screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? he demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate in the silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So, nearly free. For the past couple of weeks now, I've been noticing a few odd things in my apartment. It started off with food mysteriously disappearing from my refrigerator and pantry while I'd been away at work. I didn't think much of it at the time, since every now and then I'd lose track of my daily eating habits due to my busy schedule, so I simply brushed it off. Eventually, it didn't stop there. Almost every night, I could have sworn I could hear shuffling sounds coming from within the walls sometimes, when I got home late from work, I'd find both my computer and TV turned on, even when I distinctly remember turning them off before I left. Strangely, the TV would always be tuned to the local news, and my computer's search history would show several results for nearby takeout restaurants. Needless to say, it was freaking me out. The building I lived in had tight security with officers frequently patrolling the area, and it was located in the part of the city where crime was pretty scarce. Considering that I've given copies of my apartment keys to a couple of my friends to make sure that I wouldn't misplace them, which I so often do, I thought perhaps that one of them was trying to mess with me. I was eager to get to the bottom of this, so I asked if either of them was the culprit. However, they both blatantly denied it. This, of course, put me on edge, so I asked my landlord to check the security footage on my floor for any suspicious activity. He immediately began searching through two weeks worth of recorded footage, looking for any unfamiliar faces entering my apartment. He finished his investigation the following week and said that he found nothing out of the ordinary. There's nothing to worry about, he assured me. It's probably our your head, man. At the time, I was considering the possibility that maybe he was right. Being a domestic abuse lawyer, I've had to deal with a lot of stressful cases and work overwhelmingly long hours. Perhaps the numerous caffeine-fueled nights and constant headaches were starting to get to me. On one particular 
particular snowy day, I was coming down with a nasty cold and had to call in sick for the next few days. Despite having to reluctantly waste some of my days off on such a gloomy occasion, I was still glad to be temporarily free from my hectic obligations. It was around 7.30 and I was getting really tired. I had finally made it near my apartment on the 6th floor. I just got back from picking up some remedies at Walmart and was anticipating a nice long night of peace and relaxation. Just as I stood in front of the door, I immediately heard a faint shuffling in the distance. My eyes scanned the hallway for any signs of life. Nothing. Suddenly, I could hear footsteps quickly creaking on a wooden surface. After listening in closely, I made a chilling realization of where these footsteps were coming from. Inside my apartment. This couldn't have been one of my friends, as I had recently changed the lock on my door due to all the strange things that had been happening. A sudden chill went up my spine because I knew right then and there that an intruder had somehow broken in. At that moment, I felt really uneasy. I wanted to run downstairs and call for help, but I knew if I left the hallway at this point, the intruder would definitely make or break for it. Being the naive young man that I was, I was determined to go inside, grab my gun, and try to apprehend whoever was inside. Taking in a deep breath, I slowly unlocked the door and creaked it halfway open. I was instantly hit with a powerful, ghastly odor that made me want to vomit. It smelled like something had been decaying in there for quite some time. Ignoring it, I cautiously proceeded to the kitchen to grab the gun I kept hidden in the top drawer. I grabbed it and turned on the lights. To my surprise, the first things I noticed were several pizza boxes and takeout bags scattered across the ceramic tiles. This struck me as rather odd because I knew I didn't order any takeout that day. I also noticed that food-covered footprints were leading directly into the living room. Someone was definitely in here and it looked like they were in a hurry to remain hidden from me. I slowly made my way into the living room with my gun at the ready. The footprints led right next to the ported up wall that was stationed on the other side of the room. There were a couple of half broken planks in the middle of it that I haven't gotten around to fixing yet. Very carefully I walked towards the wall for a closer inspection. My heart was beating with every inch I took. I stopped a few feet away from it and began closely examining it. I couldn't make out anything inside, so I moved my head in even closer to search for any signs of life. Again, nothing was completely visible as it was pitch dark inside, so this time I pulled out my phone, put it in the wall and turned the screen on. Suddenly, out of nowhere, I saw two amber red eyes staring directly at me. My heart dropped like a rock. I quickly stumbled backwards, trying to keep my balance. A sudden rush of adrenaline swiftly filled my entire body. I quickly spoke in the most intimidating voice I could muster up. If you don't get the hell out of there right now, I swear I'll blow your bloody brains out, I exclaimed. Silence subsequently followed. I was half expecting some demented lunatic to rush out from there and attack me out of nowhere, so I prepared myself for an epic battle. Didn't you freaking hear me? I'm not messing around. Before I could finish my sentence, I was interrupted by a faint sobbing coming from within the wall. The intruder took in a deep breath and spoke in a soft tone. Please don't hurt me. I'm really sorry about what I've done. The intruder replied. The voice sounded like it belonged to a frightened little girl around the age of 13. This really wasn't the dramatic response I was expecting. I lowered my gun as the tension in the room quickly shifted to that of confusion. Jesus, kid, you nearly scared me half to death, I said, 
Who are you? And what exactly are you doing in there? No response. It seemed like my initial reaction shook her up a bit. It's okay. You can tell me. I promise I won't hurt you. I slowly backed away from the wall to assure her that I wasn't a threat. See? After a brief moment of silence, she replied once more. My name is Maple, she said in a jittery voice. I didn't mean to cause trouble. I only wanted to get away from my mean parents. Maple, I paused for a minute, trying to recollect where I'd heard that name before. Then it hit me. Maple was the little girl that went missing in the area several weeks ago. The media reported that she allegedly ran away from home after her parents had physically abused her last Christmas. She must have slipped into my apartment when I forgot to lock the door that day. At that moment I felt genuinely sympathetic, mostly because I've dealt with quite a few runaways in my line of work. Poor Feng must have been scared to death. I guess when I ran out of food, she decided to break into my neighbor's apartment and help herself to their leftovers. She probably dropped all of it on the floor and made a break for it once she heard me come up to the door. I remembered at this point that there was a police car parked right outside of the building. I figured that I should first try to comfort her before calling the cops over. It's okay, sweetheart. Everything's going to be alright, I assured her. Just please come out so I can make sure you're okay. She suddenly stopped sobbing and became quiet. Dead silence filled the room as I anxiously awaited the response. She was almost starting to freak me out. After about a minute passed, she finally said something. Okay. But could you first put the gun on the floor and come closer? I need help getting out. Her voice sounded slightly deeper this time. The sudden shift in tension kind of threw me off at first. I wanted to comply with her demands, but I had this strange, eerie feeling deep inside that something was off. At the time I couldn't make out what it was though. Giving in into my paranoia, I thought it was best if I just left her there while I went to get help. Oh, um, actually, just wait here, Maple. I'll be back soon with the... Wait, don't go! She interrupted in a surprisingly loud and desperate plea. The sudden outburst made my whole body flinch. You can't leave me in here. My ankle, it hurts a lot. I think I twisted it when I slipped on the floor. I don't think I can get out on my own. You have to get me out of here right now. This place is really creeping me out. I hesitated for a moment. Believe me, I wanted nothing more than to help her out. But there was something about her tone that made me feel like she wasn't completely telling the truth. My intuition's usually pretty good at judging whether or not someone was lying so I was inclined to follow my gut feeling. I'll only be a couple of minutes. Hang in there, kiddo. I promise I won't be long. I quickly ran out of my apartment before she could say another word. After a brief elevator ride down, I sped across the hall, out the spinning doors and into the freezing weather. To my relief, I found a slightly chubby officer talking to his slim partner right across the street from me. I ran towards them, eager to tell them everything that went down. Before I could make it halfway there, however, I froze. My heart sank as I remembered something that will forever send a chill down my spine. I couldn't believe I didn't realize this until now. There couldn't have been the same missing girl, because last night she was found murdered a couple of blocks away. Her lifeless body was discovered stuffed inside the wall of a vacant apartment. It was all over the news this morning. Struck and awe, I was left nervously wondering whom the hell was hiding in my walls this entire time. I wasted no time as I rushed to the police and frantically told them everything like a nervous wreck. At first, they thought it all sounded a bit sketchy, but after I persisted for a few minutes, 
were finally persuaded to follow me and take a look. Without catching my breath, I ran back to my apartment with the officers following closely behind. When we made it to my living room, I showed them where the intruder was hiding. The chubby officer told me to step back as they both threw out their guns and pointed them at the wall. This is the police. I want you to get out from there right this instant and put your hands on the ground. The officer's demands were met with silence. You have five seconds to comply or else I'm dragging you out. Still nothing. The slim officer nodded, cueing his partner to go in. His partner pulled out a flashlight and slowly walked towards the wall with his gun still drawn out. I anxiously watched as he made his way to the wall and put his head inside. He began thoroughly searching both sides. Did you find anything? The slim officer asked. Nope, it's all clear, he replied. But I can tell someone's been hiding in. Before he could finish his sentence, he paused. He puts his head in deeper for a closer inspection. Hold up, I think I see something. Judging by the surprise in his voice, I had a feeling that he was about to discover something really disturbing. I could feel it in my bones. What is it? His partner called out. The chubby officer took his head out of the wall and looked at his partner with a shocked expression. I think, I think I can see a couple of bodies inside. Those words made my entire world turn upside down. I almost couldn't believe what I was hearing. Are you sure about that? The slim officer asked. Y yeah, I'm sure of it, he exclaimed. My god, I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. These bodies, they look so mutilated. Just what the hell happened in here? The unsettling thought that I had just stood feet away from human corpses made my stomach turn. The powerful stench of decaying flesh made me want to puke my guts out. I knew right then and there that whoever had been hiding in my walls this whole time was definitely not a little girl. Hey, help me break down this wall. One of them could still be alive. The slim officer put his gun back in his holster walk towards the wall. I watched from about 15 feet away as they both started breaking down the old planks one by one. They quickly tore off three rows of them with ease while blood started pouring out in excessive amounts. Suddenly, several lifeless dismembered bodies fell right off the wall and onto the floor. My eyes grew wide with shock. Most of their flesh looked like it was violently bitten off and their mutilated faces were completely unrecognizable. The disturbing thought of the immense pain these victims must have suffered through was simply too much to take in. Upon taking a closer look at the type of clothes they had on, I made a chilling realization of who they were. They were all food deliverers from several nearby restaurants. I could barely make out the restaurant logos on their violently shredded and blood-soaked shirts. I wanted to look away from the gruesome sight, but there was something above the bodies that had caught my eye. It looked like there was something written in blood on the inside of the wall. At first, I couldn't make out what it said through the darkness of the room, so I slowly walked closer to read it more clearly. My entire body shook to its very core the instant I realized what it said. You were lucky. It started with my friend in Japan. He was a hacker and pirate and always left his computer on along with AIM and MSN. When he logged out on both, I assumed his computer finally died from overload. It was then I noticed all his posts on our favorite websites were gone. All his accounts, all his videos, all his comments. Sorry, 
I'm getting ahead of myself. My name is Nathan, and I'm a Shaden. Agoraphobia. I live in North Carolina, and I program for a living. My sister does the shopping for me, and I live in a basement. No windows. That might very well be the only thing that's keeping me safe. I woke up a month ago at 3 a.m. and sat down at my desk, ready to work a bit, but mostly chat. That's when I noticed Chaos Rita was gone. I don't know his real name, so don't bother asking. Besides some spelling issues, he was a fairly good English speaker, and I enjoyed talking to him. He also knew everything about computers, stuff I could never imagine possible. That's why I wasn't worried. It was well within his expertise to hack into sites and delete his own posts. I assumed he had gotten sick of the internet. He had been complaining about it for years. I tried discussing his disappearance with a mutual friend. He seemed confused, like he was forgetting who Chaos was. This friend was really old. I worried about his mental health, so I decided to let it go and talk about sports a bit. By this time, three or four people had stopped the logging on. Not the most unusual thing in the world. People got busy sometimes or just didn't feel like talking. Only their post disappeared as well. Now it had been a couple of days since Chaos went missing and I was getting fairly freaked out so I turned off the computer and watched TV for a while. That's when shit got scary. One of the news anchors was gone. The other would sometimes look to the spot our partner should be and look confused for a while, only to return to speaking as usual. A local show called Three Sisters or something was now Two Sisters, and yes, the third sister was gone. As with the news, sometimes there would be scenes where the third sister was important and for a moment they seemed to remember, but then they just kept acting. A cooking show just showed the studio with no host. I am a rational man and I was quick to rationalize everything. The news anchor wasn't used to working alone while her partner was sick and the show with the sisters was part of a plot. I wouldn't know. I didn't watch it. The cooking show was harder to explain. Perhaps they left the camera running while they had to leave for some reason and the network guys didn't notice. I had calmed myself down and decided to watch something else. I got a TV guide my sister had gotten me and flipped through it. That's when I noticed the freakiest thing yet, the two stooges. I stared blankly at the name, squished between an old breadcom and one of those shows about how good the 50s were was soon to start, so I flipped over to the channel. Sure enough, the title screen said the two stooges. Surely this was some joke or a rip-off. But no, it started as I remembered it, only with the stooge less. I freaked out and turned off the TV. So here I am. It's been a month and around a hundred people are missing that I know of. My sister is gone as well. I'm posting this on every site I can, hopefully reaching as many people as I can. If you can notice the people missing as well, my name is Nate Creek and I live in a small town in North Carolina. Please PM me as soon as possible. Hey Bob, Bob, help me out here. The man stared at the computer screen, furrowing his eyebrows. What do you want, Jim? Bob walked over to him, a bored look on his face. One of the AIs has a glitch. How so? I deleted several other AIs and an entertainment pack so I could install the new versions, but this AI didn't delete its memories and is panicking. I thought it was the lack of support AI because I deleted the sister file as well, but the memory logs show it started much sooner. 
He's been at this computer for hours. What's he doing? Working? Creative writing? Autobiographical diary, it says. I thought we didn't install that module on this one. It's probably a glitch of some sort. Just delete and do a clean install with the others. Jim sighed. I kinda like this one. It's just a program, Jim. It's not like it's sentient. Jim watched the visual representation of Nate underscore Creek underscore five type furiously. I guess you're right, Bob. Jim right clicked the AI and chose delete. Somebody like me, a 12 year old boy, didn't have much to do apart from playing alone in the house. My mother kept an eye on me at all times, and I can't really blame her. After all, I think I broke every single window in this house at least twice. That's why I'm not allowed to play football indoors anymore. I was getting so bored that I decided to go up and down the stairs. Up and down, up and down. That was literally the only thing I was doing that day. Mom passed by and shouted, please stop fooling around, while my brother didn't even bother to say anything. Despite that, I kept on going up and down the stairs, and I started counting the stairs to kill some time. I counted 14 steps, again and again. My brother passed by once again and whispered something like, what a numbskull. So I returned the compliment, even though he didn't really seem to listen to what I said. I went up the stairs once again, but this time I counted 16 steps. I thought that I made a mistake, since I counted the 14 steps like 10 times today, so I decided to count them again. They were 14, yeah, it must have been a mistake. That being said, I got bored of the stairs, and so I went to watch some TV instead. The following day, I resumed my routine of running around the house. I ran under the tables, went into my brother's room when he was away, and so on. I was pretty old for these things, but I was so bored that I would have done anything to kill some time. Finally, I went down the stairs and counted them once again. 18 steps. Something was wrong. I counted them again, and this time there were 15. I rushed to my brother and told him about it. He wasn't really interested, but since I kept asking, he had to get up and count them for himself. He counted 14 steps right before my eyes, then went back to his room and shut the door. I was so frustrated and confused that I decided to try something different. I covered my eyes and started going down the stairs while counting them. One, two, three, four, five. I got to the 18th step again, but strangely enough, it wasn't the last. 19, 20, 21, 22, and I kept on counting. There seemed to have no end. It was weird. Our stairs couldn't be that long. 40, 41, 42. Where would they end? I spent over an hour going down the stairs. I was already at the 120th step and still counting. I wanted to open my eyes. The curiosity was killing me. But I wanted to reach the last step before opening my eyes. Slowly the silence faded away, leaving place for some strange whistle sounds. Step by step, other weird sounds started to appear. Rumbles, scratches, and some kind of dragging noises. The sounds were stronger and clearer with each step I took. I thought I heard a muffled scream when I finally reached the last one. The 666th step. 
I just froze, feeling like my throat was being choked by some kind of pressure. The sound stopped as soon as I reached the last step. I wanted to open my eyes, but I was afraid of what I would see. It was very hot, like the heat coming out of an oven or a very hot summer night. I was struggling to breathe. I was too scared to open my eyes, so I just walked around whilst feeling the walls with my hands. I reached another set of stairs going up. I wanted to get out of that place, so I just went up. As I started climbing, the sound started again. I went up one step at a time, counting them, and naturally, the last step was the 666th. I kept going forward, feeling more tired and exhausted with each step I took. It felt like I was getting weaker with each step. As I kept walking, I stumbled across another set of steps that were going down again. I was freaking out, so I decided to finally open my eyes. Everything was red. I then looked down at my hands, and they were full of wrinkles like the hands of my grandfather. Terrified, I rushed down the stairs and at the end of them, there was no other way than up. Every time it was the same, up and down, up and down. I went up and down countless times until my weak and fragile body finally collapsed on the ground. I slowly fell unconscious as I felt something dragging me by the ankles down a set of stairs.
as a bitter wind cuts across the few patches of exposed skin on my face, I feel the cold creeping up behind me. I swear I hear her inching closer. Back in the shelter I sob. The empty hide cradles lay untouched in the corner of the room. And my wife helplessly watches my unrestrained cries. I fear the cold. Days later, I follow a set of caribou tracks. At my feet, my eyes still observe the distinct lack of a shadow. I have not seen a glimpse of it since it first vanished. With a shake of my head, I try to keep my mind focused on the hunt. The tracks lead up a sharp incline, and I concentrate to keep my steps from sliding back down the slope. At the top of the hill, I notice a distant silhouette watching. As I keep moving after the caribou, the shape stays in slow pursuit, following my tracks. I look at the thing with dread, realizing that I have at last found my shadow. Almost a week has passed since then, and my shadow still follows my every move, always just a few paces behind. I lay awake at night, watching the entrance to the shelter, dreading the day that they will crawl in through the opening. In the night, my eyes strain to make out any details of the darkness. Before me, I can feel my wife breathing deeply. I consider moving closer to conserve heat, but I dread any contact with her, as though the shadow might follow her too. When the morning comes, at last, I walk aimlessly from the shelter out into the snow. My wife watches with detached interest. I need to go where the fear began. As a fresh layer of snow tumbles down from the sky, I wander out, a clear destination scarred into my mind. The familiar shadow slithers up behind me, moving where I had just trodden moments before. Looking back, it shrinks down under the sunlight, practically invisible against the white plain of the earth. Picturing my target location in mind, I follow the frozen creek past crumbling structures of stones. The shadow fang peeks out from the rocks as I proceed past, still hanging around just behind me. With a deep shiver, I spot the place. A simple stone marks the ground, driven down through the snow by myself to leave some trace of what occurred there. Drawing closer, I find my steps shrinking shorter with each pace. Numbness settles in my fingers and toes by the time I make it to the site. I sit down by the decorated stone where it happened. This is where I killed our daughter. I brought the newborn out to this spot and abandoned her in the snow. We did not have food for her. Why couldn't she have been a son? As I sit down in the snow, the thing waits patiently just behind me. At last, I turn to look into her face, my eyes wearily gazing over her frostbitten features. The shadow being leans in closer, its chilled breath spilling out into my face. Expressionless, the cold embraces me. I feel her wrap me completely, and I dissolve into the flesh of the shadow, fading out with one last shiver. I fear the cold no longer. that suggested someone else was in your house and just thought, I don't want to know, and left it be. Sometimes, fear of the unknown just seems like the preferable option to facing a real, concrete danger. Normally, it's nothing, though. One time, the beeper function of my wireless house phone went off 
when I was the only one home. It could only be called from the living room. Another time, I swear someone took some change from my desk. They're all probably just slightly disconcerting tricks of the memory. But what would you do when something truly suggestive happens? Would you run or just ignore it like I did? Last Monday was a normal day. I got up, brushed my teeth, changed into school clothes. All little parts of my morning ritual. It seemed like it would be another totally unnoteworthy day until I saw the strings. There were three or four thick twine strings in my room. They crisscrossed between the walls around my bed, one attached to the door. No way would I have missed them before. I should have tripped over them. They were tied to pins in the walls, which had also not existed before ten seconds ago. Nobody could have been in my room while I was in it, let alone set this up. It was early and my brain wasn't processing correctly. I simply discredited the site, untied the strings and left for school, leaving them balled up on my desk. I didn't get any better later. There were hundreds of them outside my house, tied between houses, around cars, across streets. This had to be some super elaborate prank, one of those hidden camera shows or a comedy improv block. They had gotten everyone else to play along too. Passers-by were tangled in them, tying them to objects they were walking towards and away from, as if they had been were continuing to follow the course laid out for them. I nervously continued my journey to school. On the bus, everyone except me was tied to the door. At school, groups of students were tied to each other, teachers were tied to their desks and boards. Oddly enough, at this point all I could wonder was why I had been left out. When my friend Lucy sat beside me in first period, she simply plonked her back down on my lap and rested her chin in her hand, looking right past me to the window outside. Hey Lucy, no response. Come on, I didn't expect you to be in on this too. She sighed and started taking books from her back. All the books were tied to her hands. I grinned and yanked one of the strings off a book. She didn't seem to notice, instead simply disregarding the book completely, letting it drop to the floor without a moment's hesitation. Um, I leaned down, picked up her book and placed it back on her desk. She took no notice. Well, if that's how we're gonna play it, I smiled, trying to look playful, but really just trying to hide my nervousness. I bundled all of the strings attached to her together with one hand, then pulled them all free. She blinked, turning to stare at me. Holy crap, Martin, you're like a ninja or something. I've been sitting here for maybe ten minutes, I smiled again, relieved my friend had finally noticed me. Where did all these strings come from, she gasped, seemingly noticing for the first time. I assumed all of you were messing with me. She stood up, backing into a corner. No one else in the class noticed. They weren't here just a minute ago. Do you see them too? Her tone made it clear she was genuinely scared. No, didn't you? I was interrupted by my teacher slamming the door behind her. Everyone except me and Lucy murmured a good morning and still no one seemed to pay either of us any notice. People have been ignoring me all day, I said to Lucy, before turning to our teacher. Hey, dumbass, you can't teach for shit. No reaction. I'm getting away from all this crap. Lucy pulled a few strings aside and left the class. I followed and surprise, surprise, no one else noticed. 
We wandered the corridors, leaving and entering classes as we saw fit. Whenever we untied a chair or book from someone else, it was like it suddenly didn't matter to them. It didn't exist. I showed her the street outside. There were more strings than when I came in this morning. Twice as many. We carefully picked our way through the tangle, making our way to a nearby coffee shop. Not particularly grand, I know. But what would you do in our situation? As I said, fear of the unknown sometimes seems like the safer option. On a few occasions, I suggest that we untie a few more people. Lucy was opposed to it, remembering how terrified she'd been. In the coffee shop, we grabbed a couple of sandwiches and drinks from the fridge. We found a table, untied all the strings attached to the chairs, and sat down. Both ate in silence, both of us too scared, both of us distracting ourselves by watching the strangers in the shop, oblivious to the strings. After twenty minutes, Lucy spoke up. Now she's gonna take that sandwich, she said, pointing at the woman across the shop. Sure enough, she walked to the fridge and took the plastic wrapped sandwich she was tied to. She pays for it and leaves. She did so, according to the prophecies of the strings. That guy doesn't intend to pay. I watched as a man took his coffee and ran out of the store. The two servers just looking too exasperated to go after him. This is horrible, she whimpered. Let's go, please. Outside was a much better. Everyone just followed the string's instructions, going about their daily lives. Lucy announced she was going home to sleep this off, and I agreed to walk her home. She only lived ten minutes away. Away from the busier part of town, there were fewer strings. It was nicer. We could pretend it wasn't happening. When we turned onto Lucy Street, she stopped, her mouth falling open. What now? I broke the silence, my voice sounding surprisingly small. Look, she pointed outside of one of our neighbor's houses. I saw it clearly, and I'll take my memory of that moment till the day I die. A little dark imp, maybe three feet tall, walking along with his knuckles on the ground, almost like a monkey. It had two bulbous yellow eyes taking up about half of its face, and no mouth or other facial features. It was holding a hammer and a ball of twine, which was letting out behind it. It walked quickly and quietly from the front door of the house to the mailbox. It stopped, hammered the nail into the side of the box, and tied its string around it. It turned to face us and stopped when it spotted us. My bottom jaw dropped even further than it had already been, but it just stared with a look of surprise and curiosity. You could almost say it was the more frightened one. Suddenly it beckoned to us with its tiny hand. I looked at Lucy, she hadn't moved. I looked back at the imp, which stared at me. I have the distance between us and then halved it again. This wasn't fear of the unknown anymore. It was fear of this little guy. Didn't seem like anything to be scared of. When I was a meter away from it, it extended its hand. Uh, hi. I shook it. It nodded in approval, blinking its massive yellow eyes up at me. So, you're the ones in charge of the strings? It nodded eagerly. I called Lucy over, but she stayed where she was. There are more of you, another not. I wanted to ask it so many questions about what it was and where it came from, but it seemed, for now, I was stuck with only yes or no questions. Do we even have free will? It just
just looked at me almost sadly. I immediately felt sick to my stomach and couldn't bear looking at the little monster anymore. I grabbed Lucy, who had been listening to our exchange, and now sat on the curb with her head in her hands. Come on. We entered her house, and I made her a cup of tea. When I found her in the living room, she had untied her dog and was curled up with it, crying. I set the tea down and sat beside her. I'm so scared, she whispered after a good ten minutes of sobbing. I didn't answer. I couldn't. I'm going to sleep, she mumbled suddenly, and was under within the minute. Sleep was starting to sound pretty good all of a sudden. My eyelids suddenly felt like they were being weighted down. I collapsed onto the rock, and the last thing I heard before I fell asleep was the scurrying of several set of little feet nearby. I felt much better the next day, as if the whole affair had been a dream. I'd probably have believed that if I hadn't been awoken by Lucy's mother that morning, wondering what I was doing sleeping over without permission. Over breakfast, Lucy asked me why I looked so pale and nervous. I turned to her and smiled, mumbling something to her about feeling sick, but the truth was, I was scared because I couldn't see any strings and was wondering whether my actions were truly my own. I 
asked my new assistant, Dr. Anna Numerous, to contain and dispose of the chemical, as I had deemed it a failure. But, unknown to me at the time, she continued to perform tests with it. She theorized that the desired reaction could occur if the compound was introduced to isoenzymes of, uh, sorry, if she provided the compound with organic plant matter to consume. She took some of the byproducts of my tests and made them into a mixture of her own, and she put some of that mixture onto a fern she kept on her desk, completely against protocol and off the record. She told me all this later, after her own tests had failed to produce anything. Let's just say that they had failed as well. Not only did she break a dozen rules, but she also failed to create anything that could even be considered close to a success for our purposes. Looking back now, I should have fired her. She did show me something entirely unexpected and deeply interesting. The chemical had not eaten away at her fern, as she expected. In fact, the fern that she claimed was almost dead had sprouted new leaves. Quite a few, actually. At the risk of being penalized for my own assistant's actions, I accidentally reported this to my superiors. Instead of punishing me, they encouraged me to perform more tests. They saw the potential for this as a new fertilizer. From that point on, things moved quickly. Our entire team ran more tests on the original compound I had made. It turns out the chemical was more than just a decent fertilizer. We saw a 2% increase in the rate of construction of plant cells. Once my team published our findings, funding started flooding in from all over. Government agencies, farming corporations and agrochemical powerhouses were all jumping at the bit. Our findings could impact food shortages or help places that couldn't regularly grow crops. It wasn't too much of a stretch to say that our research could have solved world hunger. With all the funding and more than enough manpower thrown at this, we pressed on to the prototype development phase. Everything seemed fine. There were no issues and no downsides. We further engineered the chemical to make the affected plants drought and frost resistant as well. We even devised a means of control distribution. Two dizzying months later, we conducted the first tests on outdoor crops. This proceeded admirably, but this latest batch grew a little too fast. And more concerning, our control crops, which should have been untouched by the chemical, also showed accelerated growth. We determined that the test plants themselves were producing their own version of the chemical, which must have spread to the control crops by being carried on the wind. Or perhaps it had penetrated deep into the soil, or maybe some bees had carried it across fields. We weren't exactly sure. Regardless of how it reached them, leaves and stems on all plants in both testing plots were growing 5 to 10% faster at a cellular level. Unfortunately, it wasn't just the test and control crops that were affected. Two days later, we noticed that the forest surrounding the test fields had grown 50 yards closer. That's when we knew we had a problem on our hands. Asmet was called in to do a cleanup. They burned down all plant life and salted the soil 200 yards into the surrounding forest. They also burned and salted the testing control crops as well. While it was an embarrassing mistake, we were relieved that it was successfully contained. Our relief only lasted a few days. The forest was back to where it was originally in just two days. This extreme rate of growth made no sense. And to make matters worse, it wasn't contained. There was evidence that it had spread even further than the woods. Faster growth meant more dispersal of plant matter, which potentially meant more plants were getting tainted with the chemical. Asmet was called in again, but this time the damage was too widespread. Within days, plants all around Branamar County showed signs of hyperactive growth. On my morning drive to work, the same blind turn that I had taken dozens of times before was blocked by a giant branch that would have surely killed me if I had not stopped in time. The branch wasn't there the day before, I'm sure of it. The next day, 
the road was closed. In just a few short days, there were reports of major roads being swallowed up by greenery as far as 15 miles from our testing site. And it was still spreading, but we still didn't know how. We think the wind must have picked up the pollen or leaves or seeds of tainted plants and carried them all over the state, maybe even further. The Eleuthera company called in an emergency response force the size of a small army. They burned and salted as much greenery as they could, not leaving anything to chance. Hundreds of trained professionals managed a controlled fire. The company's ties to the outbreak still hadn't reached the public, but when the massive cloud of smoke blocked out the sun, reporters came to the largest chemical company in the tri-state area for answers. And that was Eleuthera. Some news outlets claimed the extreme overgrowth was a result of a bioweapon test gone wrong or an international act of terrorism. Some even reported that it was a sign of the end times. Panic spread across the nation, and so did the chemical. The first reports of accelerated growth in the redwood forest on the west coast came out in just two short weeks. We didn't know enough about it. Nobody did. Was it the wind that was spreading the chemical? Was it bees? Was it people? The government didn't want to take any risks. All flights and boats out of the country were shut down. The United States tried to quarantine the overgrowth. Reports of property damage flooded into news agencies. Top-heavy trees were toppling over and crushing people's homes. Tree branches were breaking in through windows and piercing walls. Apartment buildings were being torn apart by roots, plunging into their foundation. I remember the first story of a direct death caused by the plants, all too vividly. Brendan Waters was an elderly, bedridden man staying at the Woodford Manor nursing home. He woke up one day to find that his small room was being invaded by wiry vines. Those same vines were thickest around his bed where they had coiled themselves around his legs. He tried to pull them off, but they were so thick and he was so weak that he couldn't. He called for help, but the nurses were unable to get into his room. A patchwork of vines and roots had barricaded the metal door from the inside. Brendan could only weakly shout for help. Hours passed like this. We know every detail of the agony that Brendan went through because the nurses were right on the other side of his door as he screamed about the cause of his pain for 35 excruciating hours. The vines that tied him down sprouted sharp thorns that tore into his legs as they crawled further and further up his frail body. The fire department was called in. Firefighters tried going in through the third floor window, but an immense tree completely blocked it same window that Brendan asked his nurse to keep open on beautiful days was how the overgrowth got into his room in the first place. Firefighters worked in shifts to chop through the thickets surrounding the window, but it was much too slow and the branches got thicker the more they chopped. Roots squeezed Brendan's chest. The firefighters cleared out the entire nursing home and went to work, tearing down the wall nearest Brendan's bed. He couldn't feel his legs anymore. When they eventually opened up a hole into his room, they still had to contend with a mesh of pale roots on the other side. Brendan cried out for his family. None of them were there. By the time the firefighters finally carved through the thicket, Brendan was no longer screaming. His body had been pierced by dozens of sharp, tiny branches. There was no blood on the scene. The news reported that his face had bright green leaves growing out of it by the time the coroner arrived. That report came out a month ago. Many, many more have suffered the same fate since. The country fully succumbed to panic. Many attempted to burn the aggressive forest down themselves. Gasoline became more useful for starting fires than it was for cars. All major roads were blocked anyway. So many people died in this amateur-controlled fires, and they died for nothing. The plants just grew back, even faster.
faster. And it wasn't just people that were falling victim to the overgrowth. Greedy tree limbs grabbed power lines, causing power outages everywhere. Communications eventually went dark too. Thirsty roots pierced the water pipes and they soon went dry. The overgrowth took so much. Too many people have listened to the screams of their loved ones slowly being strangled by bright green leaves. All they could do was abandon them or join them. People tried to retreat to deserts, but even the deserts showed more and more signs of overgrowth. We made sure that plants treated by our chemical could be used in places where it's hard to grow crops after all. They are drought and frost resistant too. Who knows what the death count is at now? I'm sure I don't want to know. I was shipped off to the Atmosyn Scott South Pole Station in Antarctica by the US government a few days before the borders were closed. Some of the original research teams were flown out here too. We were working on modifying the original chemical, attempting to turn it into an herbicide. They even flew in Dr. Nemers too. It was clear that she was in way over her head. I should have fired her. Our team wasn't sure if the overgrowth had reached anywhere outside of North America by that point. We hoped it hadn't. But a French scientist at the United Nations flew and confirmed what we all feared. The overgrowth had crossed the ocean. She and her team traced the chemical to algae that had made its way to their shores via fish. Her wife was crushed to death by a falling tree. Her name was Julia. Disturbing questions spread throughout our makeshift research team. If fish could carry the chemical all the way from North America to Europe, how long before it made its way to other continents? How long before it made its way here? These international scientists provided invaluable information for our research. We saw some debatably hopeful results, but they were coming much too slow. We were all desperately fighting the nagging fear that we are much too late. But as the foremost experts on the chemical, if we couldn't figure out how to stop the overgrowth, who could? One day, I overheard the guards talking about the Antarctic coast having a green shore that wasn't there before, climbing up the ice walls of the glaciers. The research team and I tried to ignore these reports, hoping they weren't true. We had to ignore them and focus on getting the herbicide to work as fast as possible. But the hastiness is what got us into this mess in the first place. So we ignored the guards. We ignored the fact that they started carrying flamethrowers. We ignored the way their numbers gradually decreased. We ignored the green fuzz cresting over the mountainside and how it crept closer each day. We ignored the streaks of green in the snow that appeared in our footprints as we made our way from our quarters to the lab. Dr. Nemers didn't come into the lab one day, even though we couldn't afford days off. I had to ignore the thick teal moss that covered her like a blanket when I went to check on her in her quarters. I should have fired her. Less of my team showed up to work as days went on. They might have felt this plan wasn't going to work and decided to go out on their own terms. I had to ignore the splotchy moss that covered their quarters and how it might have meant that they didn't go willingly at all. I have to ignore all of these things and focus on my work because if I don't... There is one thing I can ignore though and it's standing about 60 feet away from me. Is it closer than it was yesterday? I first saw it as I was walking in the hall. I passed the window and saw a sharp green antenna poking out of the snow. I didn't think algae could form structures like that. A few hours later, I saw what I could only describe as leaves form on its ends, like lopsided veins. This was surely a new kind of plant life that has never existed before. It would be considered beautiful if the circumstances were different, if there was anyone besides me around to see it. But it looms out there, silently watching me, standing two, three stories tall, waiting for me to go outside so it can put me out of my misery. 
silently watching me, its blue-green skin a vulgar wound against the pure white snow. It waits just outside these walls. I had always loved horror movies. In my younger days, I may have not realized it, but I was a glutton for the terror that the films would instill in me. I subconsciously loved how they kept me up at night, small fearful eyes scanning my bedroom shadows for whatever sort of creature may be calling the darkness its home. It was to the point where I would wake up in the early hours of the morning, around 1 a.m. or so, to sneak into the instill room watch the late night screamers that would air. Often I would get caught by my mother or father about half an hour into my shenanigans, seated on the couch and wrapped in my blankie while clutching a teddy bear with eyes fixated on the television screen. It never did. My parents were too tired at the time to actually remember apprehending me. On a rare occasion though, I'd managed to make it all the way through a film from the time I'd slipped into the couch to the moment the credits rolled. At that point, the trudge back to my bedroom was a mad dash of fright, trying to evade any and all monsters or boogaboos that in my impressionable mind would grab at me and take me away. I was always successful on the return trip. It made me feel like Indiana Jones. I don't love horror films anymore, not after what happened. I was in college when the event occurred. While most people associate university with wild parties, copious amounts of alcohol, and finding as many people to sleep with as possible, my version of the experience was more tame by those standards. The evenings not spent furiously poring over my projects and classwork were spent with my one true love, my Netflix account. From the moment my last class of the day ended, I was wrapped in the sweet embrace the internet had waiting for me. I would return to my dorm, slip into my bedroom, and wear something more comfortable, and spend until about 4 in the morning, watching whatever horrors the streaming site had available to me. And for the price of $8 a month, it was the best and cheapest addiction I'd ever encountered. People I chose to interact with when I wasn't glued to my laptop were often of the same ilk that I was. Individuals who were just as obsessive over movies. We loved to be scared, and we often spoke of it. We compared reviews, discussed theories, and often got together to partake in this pieces of nightmare fuel. Usually once a week on a Saturday, in a grand marathon session that was catered by the local pizza place a large snack trip beforehand to prepare for when we were sick of the smell of grease and cheese. Many of us were members of a horror enthusiast forum to meet and talk with more people who shared our twisted ideas of entertainment. I've since removed myself completely from that site. Due to the vast duration of time that I've been with my Netflix account, I'd practically exhausted their selection of movies to stream or to my taste. I'd watch the classics, the cult favorites, the flops, the silent, the screamers, the spookers, the slashers, the foreign. Short of paying extra for a DVD plan, my partner in crime was becoming repetitive. I'd even resorted to watching the one stars, the films that were too terrible to even consider horror, but still somehow made the list filled with poorly crafted CG effects that were more terrifying than the monsters they were trying to scare me with. I lamented this to my forum mates, complaining of the lack of fresh choices on the site that filled my browser history. Many of my friends from school were having the same problems and were voicing their woes within the same thread that I had begun. Looking back on it, I realize now that this was the worst mistake I could have ever made. Had I not 
not start the death threat. Some of us might have still remained among the living, finding new ways to garner our thrills. Scream Queen 69, our username from the forum, as I won't refer to anyone by their true name to protect families, approached us at the meeting grounds the following day. Our usual location of gathering was behind the campus building, an area of concrete that sloped downwards to a door that we all assumed led to the art department basement. The top of the wall that enclosed our cold stone hill blocked off by a fence so no one could accidentally fall and injure themselves. As our group sat and talked, Eskew arrived, looking a little worse for wear. She looked tired. There were dark circles under her eyes and her face was pale. She often looked so bright and sun-kissed, full of energy, but not this time. She had said that shortly after she posted on the forums the night before, she'd been contacted by another member, asking if she wanted to watch something that, as she spoke and gave air quotes with her fingers, would change the genre for her forever, and then proceeded to send her a link to an obscure site she'd never heard of before. Between Wolf rolled his eyes, suggesting that they were only trying to suggest a film for her to watch, and that she was being crazy for ignoring them. I was growing concerned, however, as she recounted that though she originally ignored the person, they sent her messages constantly afterwards. They started out mildly enough, along the lines of, did you watch it? And what did you think? And as the night went on, they got more violent. Eskew showed me the chat history, and towards the end, it seems that her chat partner, named Behind You, was getting more and more agitated. The messages were becoming desperate. Did you click the link yet? You should click the link. You won't regret it. Click the link. Click on the damn link already. Click the bloody link. Click the 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 link. It was at this point that I grew incredibly concerned for my friend. No one else had received these messages, only her. My only advice to her was to ignore it and perhaps stay off the site for a few days. If this person didn't see her online, perhaps they would lose interest and back off. It wasn't the case, however, as SQ would come to us for the next couple of days looking more and more haggard, seeing that she couldn't rest that night. Behind you was still messaging her, and at this point it was just a repeat of the original link, pasted over and over and over. She was starting to get emails sent to her school email account. She didn't know how they got in it. Her email address wasn't listed on the forum, and it wasn't even the same one she'd registered to the site with. The sender would be blank, the subject line empty. The message was always the same. Click the link. Her inbox was flooded with at least a hundred emails by the time she returned from classes. All the same. And then the texts. An unknown number of all zeros at all hours of the day. Click the link. Even when her phone was on silent, the sound would still ring out. It was turned off and it will ring. She would remove the battery completely and still be startled by the noise of her text tone. She had submerged her phone in water to try and damage it and get rid of the noise. Still, it rang. She had put it in the microwave and turned it on for five minutes, knowing that if the appliance was broken, she would have to pay for a replacement, seeing as the appliance was provided by the dorm building. Even burned and melted in places, the battery removed and fried, it rang. It was getting to the point where SQ was growing more and more frazzled, each and every cell phone going off around her, causing her to shriek. By the fifth day, she hadn't shown up to lunch. Most of us assumed she was just trying to catch up on sleep from the incident keeping her up at night. We didn't realize she had died until two days later when her roommate complained about the smell coming from her room. The police blocked off the dorm room and her roommate was moved out to live with someone else in the building. They ruled it 
posted as a suicide, claiming that SQ had overdosed on sleeping pills. She had been found slumped over on her desk in front of her laptop, with the forum pulled up on her browser. I had managed to warm my way into her room a few days after the cleanup had ended. Her family lived on the other side of the country and wouldn't be in for another day or two to gather her things. And I had convinced the building RA that Scream Queen 69 had had a few of my items, and I just needed to get them back before they were mistakenly removed with her belongings. The RA had left me there, saying that the doors would lock behind me once I left. Alone, in the room where my friend had passed, I removed the laptop from her desk, not wanting to sit on her death throne, moved it over to the bed. SQ never kept her item's password protected and left herself log in on everything, so it was easy enough to turn the computer on and navigate my way back to the very forum she had been looking at when she died. I had found my way to her inbox, looking at the hundreds of messages from her apparent stalker, when I noticed something different. Out of the mass of links, one of them was purple. It had been clicked. I grew curious. What was it about this movie that made this person so obsessive to show it to SQ? Was it the thing that had driven SQ to kill herself? I clicked the link. At first, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The video was dark, as though it were trying to slowly process the images. Then things were starting to come into focus. A desk posters on the wall, a person sitting on the bed, a person standing behind them with a large toothy grin. It was at this point that I realized I was staring at my own face, sitting in SQ's bedroom, her posters behind me. The webcam light was on. lives up to its name, I thought, as I made my way up the damp concrete slabs, bridging across the stagnant pond. Everywhere leading up to the ashen, decrepit house was lined by rotten flowers and the congealed feces of cats, dogs, and other animals. The water itself looked like it had remained the same for centuries. This place is dead, as dead as I am. I arrived at the door, wore a collection of damp splinters and hesitantly pushed it open, causing the hinges to shriek. No, no more shrieking, please. The inside was as drab and oppressive as the outside, and my nostrils filled with the sense of mold and neglect and regret. Or maybe it's just me. I hadn't showered in days. I couldn't face the water. There was what appeared to be some kind of waiting area. Three or four old wicker chairs and one of those please be seated signs you find in posh restaurants. So, looking around for the slightest bit of human company, I sat down and waited. Despite myself, my wallet found its way into my hands. Then the picture of M I kept in there found its way in front of my eyes. I could never throw this away, no matter how many times I told myself to, for the sake of my own sanity. But I couldn't. This was all I had left of her fair white skin and pale blue eyes, and ginger hair I'd tease her about, and the freckles on her face and chest. She was beautiful. I tried to correct myself to the present tense, but I couldn't. I'd never forget the day the last of that ginger hair fell out. A cough brought me back to reality. I looked, blinking back tears to see an old man, bald and bearded, stooped over, grinning through a mouth of yellow teeth. His clothes were as grey and wiry as the hairs on his face, like he was grey water garden. 
hands in human form. Even his right eye was grey, the left was just a black empty socket, with the eyelids hanging over it forlornly. You have an appointment, he spoke, but he hadn't used his voice in years. Yes, I have a secret. I want to deposit it. I know you do, he said. He let me grasp for words, wondering how the hell he knew, when he said, you wouldn't be here for any other reason now, would you? He turned and beckoned me to follow him into the back room. I gazed at the picture of M one last time. I love you. Then I slid it back into my wallet and did as I was bid. The back room was more of the same, gray, wet, rotting and horrid. The only remarkable feature was the huge hefty ledger on an antique wooden table, next to a plain steel chalice, and in the middle of the room was a concrete pool, only a few feet across, filled with the same stagnant grey water from the ponds outside. The old man opened the ledger. You wish to deposit a secret? he asked, perhaps as a formality, or maybe he's playing with me. Yes, I said. Your name, I told him. Excellent, then let's begin. He picked up the chalice and moved to the pool. He bent down, agonizingly slow, but eventually he filled the cup and shuffled over to me. Drink the water, he told me, a grin playing upon his old and papery lips as he pushed the cup into my hand. The water will enter you, and your secret will replace it in the water. No man can discern its murky depths. His smile was now so wide I thought his face might crack open. But be warned, once I have taken custody of your secret, you can never reveal it. No one will ever know, but there will be no confidence, or confession, or chance of redemption. Are you sure this is the path you wish to take? I am. I didn't even hesitate. No one can know, for both our sakes. The old man shrugged and took a step back. I raised the cold steel to my face, but before I could drink, curiosity gripped me. Why do you take other people's secrets? In the world of the blind, the left, raspy and throaty, Tapped at his missing eye, the man with one eye is king, and I knew exactly what he meant. For you, M, I thought, as I dumped my morbid toast. I dropped the chalice and left without a word, knowing now that she was safe. As I walked out of Greywater Gardens, I looked down at the putrid pond and remembered. It wasn't the water that was grey at all, but her face as I held her frail body down in the bathtub. showed up today. That's the third this week. They're beautiful flowers. They really are. Roses and lilies, bursts of color and baby's breath. Lovely arrangements that would make anyone happy to receive. Yet, every time they arrive, I can't help but feel a stab of fear. I guess I should explain. This all started back in college, when I started dating this guy. We we'll call him Mike. He was a nice enough guy, we just weren't really compatible. I don't know, it didn't work out for the same reason many things in college don't work out. And I never would have given it a second thought, or even really remember him at all, if it weren't for the flowers. The first bouquet showed up the week after our last date, after I texted him to say, this isn't working out. They were vibrant blue chrysanthemums and white roses. They came with no note or explanation. They merely appeared on the welcome mat in front of my apartment door. I waited for him to try and 
follow up to get back together with me, but he never did. I even texted him to thank him for the flowers, and he insisted he didn't send them. But of course he'd say that. But then, in a few weeks, another bouquet arrived. And then another, and the week after that, a third. And pretty soon, the flowers were coming every week. When I moved out of my apartment, they were waiting for me at my new address. When I got a job in a different state, they arrived at my workplace, placed cheerfully on my desk. I called and texted Mike, trying to get him to stop, but I kept getting a message failed, or this number has been disconnected. I guess he changed his number. Maybe he didn't want me calling to harass him. The flowers kept coming, and I started to get creeped out. How did he know where I lived? How did he keep finding me? I changed my phone number, I moved, I became meticulous about hiding my identity online. I called the florist and begged them to put me on a no-deliver list. I even called the police and tried to file a report that I was being stalked. Let me tell you, trying to get the police to do something about a guy delivering you flowers, not an easy task. But nothing I did could keep the flowers from coming. They just kept showing up every week, and then twice a week, for nearly three years now. No matter where I live or where I work, somehow the flowers just keep coming. Which brings us to today and the newest bouquet. Usually, when I get them, I'm exasperated or a little uneasy or just plain mad. But lately, I've been getting more and more scared. Because I was on Facebook the other day prowling through friends of friends and old classmates, snooping around the way you do when you've had a couple of drinks and a free evening. And I found Mike's Facebook page. It was covered in memorial and warning messages. Because Mike's been dead for nearly three years. there from the time you were born. I stood in the delivery room, staring down at you before you could even open your eyes to see me. Your parents, relatives, and doctors couldn't see me there, in the corner, watching you with cloudy eyes, but I was there from the time you were born. And I followed you home. I was with you always, your constant companion. You played with your toys alone. While I stared from all angles and nearby mirrors, my matted, clotted hair with oily sweat that hung on my dented forehead like glue. I was always your constant companion, drifting behind your mother's car on your ride to preschool. You alone in the bathroom, but I was on the other side of the door, wind whistling through the bruised hole in my throat. My arms twisted and hanging in their sockets, as I stood hunched on the other side of the shower curtain. I wait and follow you. I follow and drift behind you. I'm not seen. I'm almost not there in light. You never saw me that morning as I sat across from you at the breakfast table, a shiny red cloth hanging from an empty tooth socket as I caped grotesquely at you. I wonder sometimes if you know I'm there. I think you are aware, but you'll never understand just how close I am. I spend hours of your day doing nothing more than breathing in your ear. Breathing, gagging really. I crave to be close to you, to always wrap my crippled arms around your neck. I lie near you every single night, cloudy eyes staring at your ceiling, underneath your bed, at your sleeping face in the dark. Yes, you caught me staring occasionally. Your parents came running down to your room one night when you screamed. You were just beginning to talk, so you were only able to cry out, Man, man in my room. You thought the 
you'd never forget the sight of me, with my collapsed jaw hanging to my chest, swinging back and forth. I sank back into your closet and your mother was unable to see me, though you pointed and pointed and pointed. You thought you'd never forget when they left that same night. You saw the closet door crack so softly, and me crawling across the floor to your bed on all fours, shambling and jerking movements as I pushed myself onto your bed on disjointed limbs. You learned a new word for me, boogeyman. Not quite the monster you thought I was. I'm just waiting and following you, always touching your face with my knotted fingers as you sleep. You'll see me again soon, any day now. I'm coming, blunt and brutal. One day you'll walk across the road and I believe I'll plow into you with a loud roar and a screech. You rolling on the pavement, rolling under wheels, blunt force metal fenders and my finger touching your face again and again. As you stare up from the cold pavement with cloudy eyes, your matted, clotted hair hanging in your face and your jaw unhinged and swinging to your chest, you'll see me approaching. No one else will see me. You will stare past them into my eyes and I leer down at you. For the first time in our life, something like a smile would come over my face. You'll swear you're looking in the mirror as clotted red bubbles form around our mouths. I lean down past the doctors and the ogling people and pick you up in my crooked arms. Our faces will touch my wings will unfurl, and then you'll have to follow me, and I am always with you, I am your guardian angel. This is a game where participants get the chance to meet the twin they've never known in life. It's a simple game to play, but the repercussions can be overwhelming. The twin is a reflection of who you really are, not who you pretend to be. If you're a genuinely good person, your twin encounter would be a pleasant and gratifying experience. But if you're a bad person, Someone who bullies, lies, steals, cheats, manipulates or hurts other people, then your experience will be dark and painful. In order to play the game, you require the following. An empty closet, a lit candle and a mirror. To start, hang the mirror, any size will do, on the wall in the closet. Be sure to hang it on the wall across from the closet door so the door is being reflected when closed. With the candle already lit, walk into the closet and shut the door behind you. Look at the mirror, you'll see a reflection of yourself in the closed door. Knock on the mirror twice, just as if you're trying to knock on the closet door. Blow out the candle and knock on the mirror two more times. You'll hear the closet door open, but the door behind you is still shut. Next, you'll hear a breathing. The game has begun. In a calm voice, greet your twin with a simple hello and wait for the response. Afterwards, ask a simple yes or no question. They will answer. The twin will respond in one of two ways kind response or a hostile response. Good people will receive a kind hello in return for their greeting. Ask your question and your answer will be whispered back to you. Shortly after, a sense of warmth and comfort will overcome the player. The sound of a door shutting will signal the end of the game as your twin has made contact passed on their message and 
left the closet. Bad people will receive an angry animalistic snarl in response. If you try to ask a question, you will be answered with scratches or bites from your twin. A bone chilling cold will fill the closet and a sense of impending doom will bring about an unshakable feeling of dread that will linger for hours. You'll hear the sound of the closet door slamming shut and the mirror will fall off the wall, shattering into pieces. When you leave the closet, be sure to take the mirror with you, intact or broken. If you leave the mirror behind, you'll be plagued by your twin's voice calling out to you and knocking on walls until you remove the mirror. This game reveals a lot about a person's soul. Players beware. Gotta get closer to the sun. Words I've lived by. My entire reason for being. From the earliest of my memories, I recall seeing that glorious great globe of gold glimmering down on this dark, shrouded world. I knew something personal, something the sun and I would share with no other. We are one. My early life was spent daydreaming, fascinated by the marvel of its light. It wasn't until I was about 12 years old that I realized I had to get my head out of the clouds. I worked studiously, every shred of schoolwork, all of the filler assignments, I gave every bit of it my all. It's so cute, people would say before ruffling my hair with their dingy, condescending fingers. All little boys want to be a spaceman, don't they? Well, this was different. I didn't want to be an astronaut. I was going to be an astronaut. What I wanted back then, still do to this day, is far greater than some exploratory science. Ascension. I worked tirelessly through my late teens and early twenties. My parents had some money put aside for my education, but it wouldn't be enough. I had to master engineering and physics, at the least. I had to stand out in the crowd. And I did. Finally chosen, I knew it had little to do with all the effort, all the slaving away. It was destiny, fated to be. This is the last piece of terrestrial communication that I'll ever create, the last remnant of my human condition. Currently, no one's the wiser, not the few undeserving souls with me on this shuttle, not mission control. Not my family or friends. I'm going to transcend, to become so grossly incandescent as to reach Godhood. My parents named me Kevin, but it's a false moniker. My name is Helios, and I have one human thought left. One last concept buzzing in my brain, as I prepare to entwine my energy with destiny. Gotta get closer to the sun. As usual. He's always there, but he seems to prefer early mornings to show himself. He mimics my every movement, copies who I am to a D. The first time I saw him, I thought he was just a reflection from a window in the shadowy corners of the underground parking lot. Maybe even a trick of the brain, a figment of my imagination. The second time I saw him, I paid more attention. I assumed some local weirdo was trying to freak me out, which it bloody well did. As I watched the movements though, they were far too precise, far too exact to have not been me. It feels so contrived saying it, 
but after that point I avoided the parking lot altogether. Taking the long way to the station added another 5 minutes to my morning commute, but that's an insignificant price to pay for peace of mind. What's 2 hours lost a month anyways? I suppose they didn't like that, because they started seeing him everywhere. Little things at first, a shadow, just a bit too far away, or contradicting the lighting. Strange movements of my reflection's eyes in the mirror. Eventually, it was as he was part of my daily life, an exact precise imitation of me. With only one difference, he was watching me. He'd always have his head turned to me when I'd look at him. His piercing gaze was hollow and haunting. I began to consider that I was losing my mind. I saw a psychiatrist and after some sessions was prescribed some pills. Surprise, surprise. Even as I took the pills, so too did my mirror man. My mirror man was gone for a while. I had considered that the pills may actually be working. How foolish I was. He must have been hiding, tricking me. It seems he comes and goes at his own discretion. Well, today's the day. Today I will confront him, expose him for the world to see. Then everyone will notice him, see him for the imposter that he is. They'll know it's not just in my head. He'll be punished for this harassment. As I stand up from my desk in my cubicle, I see him do the same. What a phony. I'll relish in exposing him. He returns the same devilish, scheming grin back to me. You're a fraud, I yell as I storm toward him. He storms towards me. I wag my finger, prepared to yell again as I notice his mouth opening to do the same. We both pause. Everyone around is looking at us. No, not at us. At him. Yes, they see him. One of my fellow office workers slowly approaches him. Calm down. It's okay. We can sort this out, she says to him. Something is very wrong here. I left a finger to point at him as he points at me. You can see him right, we both yell in unison. It's okay, there's no one there, you're okay, she says in a soothing voice. This isn't right. What's going on over there? I hear someone yell from a few cubicles down. He's having another episode, she yells back. He and I lock eyes. I feel a chill wash over me. We both share the same horrified expression for a brief moment. Before his begins to change. Mine doesn't. Slowly his gritted teeth and clenched jaw relax. His pursed lips soften. Then slowly form into a smile. You're not real, mirror man, he says mockly. Terror washes over me as other office workers look in my direction to where he is staring. They aren't looking at me. They are looking through me. I feel faint, weak. My vision blurs. All movement descends to slow motion. I begin to flee this strange situation. As I reach the door, I push, but nothing happens. It remains closed. I turn to see him still grinning at me, hot and powerful. You're powerless without me, he says confidently. A cold sweat breaks over my brow. My palms clam up and a pit forms in my stomach as the fear sinks in. I turn back to the door, pushing desperately to escape when I see a petrifying sight. The reflection in the door's window shows me the entire room. My co-workers, my cubicle, I see everything in the office, everything but me.
just moved into a little ranch house in the suburbs. Storybook neighborhood. Quiet, friendly neighbors. Picket fence. The whole nine yards. Suffice it to say, this was supposed to be a new start for me. A recently single dad and my three-year-old son. Time to move on from the previous year's drama and stress. I viewed the thunderstorm as a metaphor for this fresh start. One last show of theatrics before the dirt and crime of the past would be washed away. My son loved it anyway, even with the power out. It was the first big storm he'd ever seen. Flashes of lightning flooded the bare rooms of our house, parting unpacked boxes with long creeping shadows, and he jumped and squealed as the thunder boomed. It was well past his bedtime before he'd finally settled down enough to go to sleep. The next morning, I found him awake in bed and smiling. I watched the lightning at my window, he proudly announced. A few mornings later, he told me the same thing. You're silly, I said. It didn't storm last night. You're only dreaming. Oh, he seemed somewhat disheartened. I ruffled his hair and told him not to worry, there should be another storm soon. Then it became a pattern. He would tell me how he watched the lightning outside his window at least twice a week, despite there being no storms. Recurring dreams of that first memorable thunderstorm I figured. It's easy to hate myself in hindsight. Everybody assures me there's nothing I could have done. No way I could have known. But I'm supposed to be the guardian of my child, and these are useless words of comfort. I constantly relieved that morning, making my coffee, pouring milk over my cereal, picking up the newspaper to read about the pedophile local authorities had just arrested. It was front page stuff. Apparently, this guy would select a young target, usually a boy, stake out their house for a while and take flash photos of them through their window but they slept. Sometimes he did more. My stomach sank as the connection was made. At the time, it was merely something from a child's imagination. In retrospect, it is the scariest thing I've ever heard. But a week before the predator was caught, my son came up to me in his pajamas. Guess what? He asked. What? No more lightning at my window. I played along. Oh, that's nice. It finally died down, huh? No, now it's in my closet. I've yet to see the photos the police have collected. She stalked the dark hallways of the school, making sure that she made no unnecessary sounds that would attract anyone. She had been following her math teacher for a few minutes now, and was positive that she had seen him wander into the school building. She checked her watch. She had about an hour to the curfew. The school was deserted, as it had been for the last summer month. She was being extra cautious. She didn't want anyone seeing her follow her teacher into the school. That could only bring trouble. She followed her teacher into the dark hallways. Her teacher seemed to be wandering aimlessly, oblivious to his follower. She waited for him to move into some place quieter so she could make her move. Finally, her teacher stopped in front of the bathroom, probably intrigued by the sound of rumbling pipes, and slowly made his way inside. Perfect, she muttered to herself as she reached around for a pink backpack and withdrew a bloodied solid lead pipe from within and made her way into the bathroom. She carefully closed the bathroom door behind her and ever so softly turned the lock. The soft clink of the lock 
made her teacher turn around to face her. She could see the look of confusion in the old man's eyes. She followed his gaze to the lead pipe in her hands and watched as his face contorted into a hideous snarl as he lunged towards her. A smile forming on her lips, she sidestepped and drove the pipe with all her might into the back of his head with a snickering thump. She watched him crash into the floor. Soon enough, a pool of dark blood formed around his head. She had done this way too often than she cared to admit. As her math teacher lay on the white tiled bathroom floor, twitching uncontrollably from the skull bashing he had received just a few seconds earlier, she stood over him, her feet on the either side of his waist. She looked him right in the eye and said, This is for the C minus on my last paper, and drove the pipe into his skull again, finishing him. As she wiped the blood and brains from the lead pipe, the walkie-talkie in her backpack crackled. Bulldog, this is Pace. What's your status? Over. Pace, this is Bulldog. The school is clear. I repeat, the school is clear. Returning to Pace now, over and out. As she made her way out of the bathroom, she glanced towards the corpse of her math teacher and muttered to herself, Man, this zombie apocalypse is stressful. Nobody gets it. 
They all come back to return it after a while. The shopkeeper leaned on the counter and I could see that he was breathing heavily and perspiring. They all think it's some sort of trick till they start seeing it when the light's off. That ain't no projection, mister. That damned thing. That light. It ain't making up those creatures. It's just letting your eyes see what's already there. a.m. on New Year's Day of 2002, the ABC television station in Waco, Texas, named KXXV, Channel 25, was hacked into and a creepy broadcast was sent over the airwaves. Not many people know about it, since most people were asleep by 1.42 that morning, and very few of the people still awake were watching Channel 25. The few that were, however, reported seeing static run over the usual talk show that aired at this hour. The static lasted for 15 seconds before an image suddenly appeared on screen. It was a distorted image of someone's face, someone with a balding head and a white smile. The distortion also made their eyes appear large and glassy, and their teeth look long like a rodent's. The image was also accompanied by a startlingly loud, deep rumbling noise. Some say that it resembled actual human speech, though it was too low pitched to make out. This image, as well as the audio clip played alongside, lasted for about 90 seconds in total. Finally, another 15 second long burst of static came on screen and the station cut back to the usual talk show. But there have been some strange reports over the years. Rumors say that about a week after the incident occurred, three of eight people known to have watched it that night were deemed legally insane sent to the Texas Department of Mental Health. When asked by the interviewers what they saw that night, they would only say he is after us all, and the demon makes things red. When asked what they meant, they would reply that they heard what the figure was saying quite clearly, even though the other reports, including the ones filed by people who saw recordings of the video, mentioned the rumbling being too deep to understand. These people mentioned that the voice was saying things like suck their souls and watching all, though they refused to explain what these things meant. They also reported that the supposed image was actually a video and that the being's head was shaking violently, his eyes starting back and forth his mouth moving with whatever he said. All other reports say that the image was, indeed, a still one. Following the incident, police made efforts to track down the person who hacked Channel 25 that fateful New Year's Day, but to no avail. However, it did turn out that someone had a recording of it. Mr. Albert Fenster who was going to a party on New Year's Eve, wanted to watch the local news coverage of the event, so he had been recording KXXV that morning, having started recording at 10.01 p.m. and finished at 8.33 a.m. the next day. Within the recording was the incident. Unfortunately, the VHS was somewhat corrupted, 
so that the only known footage of the incident is messed up almost beyond recognition. Beneath is a still out of the only 45 seconds of the incident footage that wasn't messed up by corruption. It's still partially corrupted though, as a red after image hunts the left side of the screen. some moves. I never was worth much on the dance floor. 
somehow I satisfy. Perhaps they think I am being edgy. Perhaps I am kidding myself. One young guy breaks straight into a practically flawless rendition of the robot dance, straight from some neon 1980s nightclub. I wish I had thought of that until a few moments later when his corpse thudded to the floor. Never pander, never patronize. Though blinding lights perpetuate in our jaded faces, from this cold steel stage our view is only darkness. They don't need illumination to see. They are out there somewhere, I imagine. Perhaps they use cameras. Perhaps their senses are beyond my human comprehension. The most tasteless trash makes them sit up and listen. They seem to prefer buffoonery to high culture. I don't know if this reflects their desires or ours. But it must always be fresh. Any repeat of the same material is unthinkable, unacceptable. Very occasionally, our routines are met with a scratchy, almost inaudible hum of approval from the gloom. A synthetic symphony. Once I bowed in gratitude, a rest which drew gasps from my compadres. It must have succeeded, for still I exist. One of the stunned, an elderly British despian whom I'd seen in a few movies, lingered too long and was gone. We can collaborate. One Direction, Subvert, inspired myself and three others to hastily recreate the caustic comedy and twisted malice of the old Adams Family TV show, which quickly descended into the recreation of a medieval torture dungeon. The audience sees nothing immoral about this, just as they don't get the subtlety or irony. They must have approved they produce props for us to use from the Stygian gloom. Props are a rare treat. I did things I never knew I was capable of. I guess we all have to these days. This drew hatred from my associates. I saw murder in their red eyes and heard their hisses over the encouraging din from the theater seats. Sometimes their direction is enigmatic, sometimes straightforward. Luckily, I can improvise. Think on my feet. What is left of them? Sometimes we get a real gem, such as what can't grow can never be beaten. That sort of thing always causes someone to fumble, and so our troop grows fewer in number. Sometimes we get fed the mystery meat. Never very much. They like to keep us lean, hungry. All I know is that it's pink and fake and grows in petri dishes. One tall girl, whom I might have seen modeling in magazines, seemed to enjoy things to an extent. She was into extreme body modification. They supplied her with knives and she complied. She was insane to begin with, which made me immensely jealous. By the end, she had no eyelids no lips and no fingers to grip. So she banged her head hard on the floor until you couldn't see who she'd been anymore. The hiss of rapture came, louder than I've heard before. I want to watch. I want to see what you see. She screamed and flung herself with demented glee into the audience. That idea must have crossed all of our minds once or twice, out of sheer curiosity or a faint hope of respite. Silence, the familiar scent of sizzling flesh. Their next direction comes. Is there any water in the desert? This causes me to pause. My mind is blank, or perhaps it has gone. Do you 
wish to access the Womanly Corporation archives? Yes, accessing archives. Welcome to the Womanly Corporation, the leading pioneer in making the world more woman forward and woman inclusive. We're kind of the only pioneer right now. Don't worry, we're definitely not trying to take over the world. That would be silly. Message from the archives developer. Please ignore the previous message. We're trying to be professional here. Strangely enough, we can't seem to remove any entry from the archives. So just ignore it. The great experiment is perfectly safe and does not have ulterior motives. We are not lunatics. Subject 001 Transcript February 19 research notes. After injecting subject 001 with the test substance W, we have achieved great results and success. After years of trying to create the perfect womanly substance, we have done it. Subject 001 began to change noticeably 10 seconds after the injection. The subject's hair lengthened, his body began to become more slender and his facial structure became more feminine. After 10 more seconds of metamorphosis, subject number 001 was now a woman. Interestingly, the subject looked like a clone of our good Mrs. Sarah Allure. In the way of internal effects, the subject's voice had increased in pitch. The subject expressed mild surprise, but was otherwise stable remembered everything about themselves. February 20th. Enclosed is a transcript between Subject 001 and Subject A2 during their first encounter after the injection. A2 asks, Derek, is that you? 001 replies, Uh, yeah, totally. Why are you looking at me like that? You're a freaking woman. So, so it's weird. Ah, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe they can turn me back later. A2 places his head in his hands and sighs. You are literally the opposite gender now. You can't possibly be saying it isn't bad. Fred, my dude, I'm fine. I'm alive. That's enough for me. Jeez, fine. End of transcript. February 21st. Research notes. Strangely, subject 001 seemed to be experiencing some behavioral changes in their next encounter with subject A2. Enclosed is the transcript from this encounter. 001 says, Hey Fred. You seem awfully chipper today, but hello to you too. Okay, so, like, I was thinking, what? Wouldn't it be so funny if we were, like, both women? That would be just the funniest thing ever, right? Zero, zero, 001 jiggles. Uh, I think I would pass. No offense, but I kind of like being a man. Ah, uh, being a guy is so boring. Come on, it would be so fun. You're acting really weird, Derek. A2 addresses the scientists. Is he supposed to be acting this way? A scientist with their name redacted reassures him. Just hang in there, A2. If you're in any danger, we'll send in some guards. 001 asks, why would you send in guards? A2 replies, don't know, just in case you suddenly attack me or something. Let me repeat, you're acting weird, Derek. Who's Derek? What? What? No comprendo, dude. What the hell do you mean, who's Derek? No, really, who is Derek? He sounds hot. 001 jiggles louder. That's your name. Your name is...
is Derek and did you just call yourself hot? Oh silly Fred, have you forgotten? My name is Daniela. End of transcript. At this point the conversation was stopped and the subject A2 was escorted away. February 22nd. Research notes. The final encounter. Subject A2 was sent to talk with 001 again, but this time with a list of questions to ask her to test her memory. And closed is the transcript. A2 says, Yo, um, I have a list of questions I'm supposed to ask you. Yeah. 001 replies, Go right ahead and ask them, sweetheart. 001 smiles widely. What the actual hell? Anyway, what's your name? Daniela. Are you sure? Why would I not be sure? You know what? Forget it. Next, where do you live? I live here. Where is here supposed to be? This place, obviously. I didn't know you were so dense. Wait, what? You live in New York? New York? God damn it, okay. Do you remember how you got here? Not particularly, no. So what do you remember? I remember I've lived here my entire life. And you are there. Zero one stares off into space. But what? Zero zero one smiles widely again. Fred, I was thinking, you should join us. What kind of 180 shit is that? Who is us? No, no, I misspeak. You must join us. It's the only way. No, no way. A2 addresses the scientists. Get me out of here, please. Oh, Fred. She's expecting you. It would be very, very rude of you not to come. Derek, get a hold of yourself. The guards are gonna put you down if you don't calm down. Aha, what a great joke, Fred. End of transcript. Research notes. Transcript stops here. Zero zero one at this point suddenly leaped from her seat and scratched out at A2 repeatedly. Card successfully managed to save A2 and contain zero zero one. Upon examination, A2 had sustained multiple deep scratches on his face, neck and arms. Each scratch appeared to be slowly dripping a pink substance and the subject was very weak. Rest assured, however, We'll keep trying. We'll make them less hostile, unless their hostility could serve some purpose to our cause. No one but Sarah knows yet, but we'll keep trying anyway. February 23rd. Research notes. Inexplicably, 001 has taken an extreme liking to Sarah, even seemingly considering her an idol. Sarah appears to be amused by this. But the way she takes an interest to this behavior, is she possibly encouraging it? This great experiment is becoming more complicated than I thought. I don't think I'm up for this, personally. What even is our cause, and why does it just seem to spell disaster? Transcript of a conversation between Dr. Axo and the scientist with the redacted name. Dr. Axel, are you quite sure that you stand behind our cause 100%? Yes, I'm sure. Why do you ask? In the transcript reports, you seem to experience some doubts. That was extremely childish of me. Don't worry, I've put those doubts behind me now. So you agree that those doubts were irrelevant to our final result? Yes, they are irrelevant. Good. We can't let anything, 
much less doubts jeopardize the experiment. You may go now. End of transcript. Upon leaving, Dr. Axel nervously comments something in a muffled voice. God, I could barely keep a straight face throughout all that. Those bloody bastards. was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not 
thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things, the mind so slight and evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock, which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I camped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first spied it. By the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance, an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but before the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy indeed. I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my back, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me, but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of paradise lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose deeply about a hundred yards ahead of me, an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. For despite its enormous magnitude and its location in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, 
Now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented the marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound, plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size, were an array of bass reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of Adore. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms, I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a bow or bulwer, they were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seemed to have been sizzled badly out of proportion with their scenic background for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange sights, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Belta. Neanderthal man was born. I was struck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist. I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then suddenly I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemous like and loathsome, darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, above which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed loudly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm sometime after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by a captain of the American ship, which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing. I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient 
Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is giveless and wane, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am going to end matters, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Often I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure fantasm, a mere freak of fever, as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, whatever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny or exhausted mankind, of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend the mist of pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand, the window, the window.